Was this the first time you published it? I'm starting the meeting. All right, good afternoon. It's 2 p.m. and I would like to call the February 21st, 2023 Committee of the Whole meeting to order and acknowledge that the City of Fort Saskatchewan is located within Treaty 6 territory and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4, the ancestral and uh, traditional territory of the Nihayawak, Dene, Blackfoot, Salto, Nakota Sioux, and Métis. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations. It is because of our treaty relationship that we can live, work, and play on Treaty 6 territory. So first, I would like to, uh, next to our business, is to adopt the, the minutes. Are there any errors or omissions required for the minutes? Not seeing any, I'll need a motion to adopt the, the minutes of the October 18th, 2022 Committee of the Whole Meeting. Okay, let me try this again. Use your finger. There he is. I'd like to uh, move that the minutes are approved as printed and circulated. All right, uh, do we have a a motion that is the motion yeah. I move okay may I like yeah. speak to your motion no I just moved that they're uh, moved as printed and circulated all right all right I'll close the motion cast your vote please okay you normally ask if there's any errors or omissions I did that at the beginning I think okay all right that's carried unanimously uh, item number three is delegations. Those individuals in attendance at the meeting will be provided with an opportunity to address council regarding an item on the agenda. And those items on the agenda today are indoor recreation service level review phase one, financial services policy update, and fees and charges policy review. Um, are there any delegations present that would like to speak to any of those items on the menu or on the agenda? I'm not seeing any. So we'll move to item number four, indoor recreation service level review phase one. And I would like to invite Brad Babiak to come forward. And if you could introduce uh, the, the, the members that are with you today, and perhaps they can give us a little bit of understanding of their role in developing the report. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of committee. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Brad Babiak. I'm the city's director of culture and recreation. And I'm joined today by Mike Roma, uh, to the far left, my far left, and Rob Park, who's joining us in the audience, from RC Strategies, and Addo Kanchin of ACI Architecture, Inc. We're here to present the findings of the Harbor Pool Facility Assessment Report and help answer any questions you may have. Um, I'll turn things over to Mike a little later to do a more extensive introduction of their roles and their responsibilities related to the report. Uh, but I'll just get through some other pieces first. So today's presentation will look at the purpose of the report, the background of how this work fits into the larger indoor recreation facility service level review that we're undertaking, uh, the project team members who led the development of this report, as well as a summary of the key findings, and then key takeaways to consider. And finally, we'll talk about next steps in the indoor recreation facility service review overall. So the purpose of today's presentation is to share the findings related to the condition of the Harbor Pool building and mechanical pool mechanical systems, and the potential scenarios for capital investment, as well as answer any additional questions the committee may have related to these findings. So in terms of background, at the May 10th, 2022 regular council meeting, council endorsed the indoor recreation service level review. This review has three sections of work to complete. This first piece is the report on Harbor Pool. And this, is, this report is focusing strictly on the infrastructure lifestyle perspective of Harbor Pool and not the functional perspective of the operations. 
Uh, the second section of the review will be determining the current indoor recreation service levels needed within the community to develop a recommendation on an indoor recreation facility program. And then the final section of work to be analyzed is the city's current ability to meet the recommended facility program that gets developed and what facilities offer the best efficiency and effectiveness to deliver on that proposed program. So at this time, I'll pass things over to Mr. Roma so he can share more about the project. Thanks, Brad. Uh, Mr. Chair, Your Worship, members of council, uh, great to be here. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, as Brad mentioned, uh, RC Strategies is the prime consultant for the overall uh, project that we're working on, which is about indoor facilities and looking at your current state and uh, I guess expected future state or where you might want to plan to be in the future related to those indoor facilities. But today, this is just about the current state of the harbor pool um, on a like for like basis. So when we come back uh, in front of you fairly soon to talk about some of the other research that's conducted, the community engagement or community input that we're gathering about indoor facilities, about aquatics, but uh, all the other indoor facilities that you invest in, we'll be able to talk more about um, where we think the research and input is pointing in terms of changing service levels. But this information today is about the harbor pool and um, maintaining or sustaining that level of service, so what exists in the pool uh, moving forward. So just want to frame it because that's an important uh, thing to remember. Um, we're going to have some numbers. Edo's going to talk about some numbers. Everybody likes numbers. I just want to make sure that this is just about the harbor pool and there very well could be other numbers that we talk, talk to you about the next time we're in front of you. So um, in order for us to uh, complete a project like this, so RC Strategies is a recreation parks planning company. Uh, we specialize in that. That's all we do. Our head office is in Sherwood Park, uh, but we work across Canada. And uh, sometimes we get charged with um, bringing back information and helping municipalities make decisions on subject matter that we can't tackle ourselves. So when that's the case, we bring on subconsultants, uh, teams of architects, engineers, landscape architects to help us answer some of the questions and dig up some of the technical details that we need. And in this case, uh, we decided to team with architect or, um, ACI Architecture, which is Edo's firm. Um, and Edo brought a few other pieces to uh, his team on the engineering side and actually an aquatics expert as well called WTI. So um, Edo's team has been responsible for looking at the harbor pool uh, we know it's been looked at before, but looking at it in a 2022-2023 uh, uh, context. And that review was influenced by a number of things. So there was a facility assessment. Uh, Edo and his team of engineers visited the facility, um, had discussions with administration and staff. Uh, there were a lot of other studies that have been done uh, around the harbor pool and I can actually say when I started my career as a parks and rec consultant uh, one of the first reports that I worked on was not dissimilar assessment of the harbor pool with a 2004 date on it which I was actually able to dig up and share with the team so uh, we know that you know you've looked at the pool a lot um, and it's still meeting community needs as it is it's a very um, functional pool um, or at least it's functional with the uh, kind of amenities and and the structure that it has uh, that it has right now but uh, we also know that you've you've looked at it a lot so um, not only that but we we chose Edo and his team and WTI because we we know that they have lots of good and recent experience in aquatics and in looking at, uh, I guess, adjusting, enhancing, sometimes replacing, sometimes reinvesting in aging pools. So as Edo goes through some of the subject matter today, you'll see that there's a lot of consulting team experience that um, will uh, provide value to you and, and information to you. The last thing I'm going to talk about 
is a couple of lenses that uh, we've asked Edo and his team to look at the harbor pool through. One of them is called Facility Condition Index, and that focuses on the mechanical, structural, electrical elements of the building and um, assesses it based on a more technical or engineering perspective. Um, facility Condition Index means, or what, what that is, is actually a ratio of what the required reinvestment in a facility is compared to its replacement value. So if you're going to rebuild it right now, what it would cost on a like-for-like -like basis to do so. So the punchline is on the next slide, but I'm not going to get to that next. And Edo's going to give you what the facility condition index is for the current building. But the other lens that we wanted to um, capture, and we actually had to bring on WTI as an as a expert in aquatics to do so, is for them to give us their opinion on kind of the, the state of the aquatics elements, because obviously it is a pool. You can look at the envelope, you can look at the structural, mechanical, electrical, but there's also another dynamic related to the specifics about being a pool, and there's not that many experts out there that can give that type of assessment. So WTI is one. They have a tool um, that <clears throat> was explained in the report, um, and uh, again, there's a punchline that Edo's going to deliver related to their, their work as well. So with that, I'll pass it over to Edo. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, your worship, councillors. Uh, like Mike said, I'm here to deliver some of the punchline news to the assessment we completed uh, with our staff as well as with the aquatics expert at WTI. Uh, the first thing in our analysis that we looked at is the actual facility or building where the aquatics components are. As you can appreciate, uh, aquatics is a very complex system within a building, and the building itself is relatively quite simple to hold this kind of environment. So based on our design and engineering assessment of the facility, we believe that the condition index is 52%, which means that in relatively easy terms, uh, the renewal or reinvestment within the current harbor pool facility would equal 52% of the replacement cost should you uh, choose to replace the pool in an independent location for a like-to-like -like replacement. Um, it's not meant to misguide you or misdirect you, like for like means we will replace exactly what you have there today in its current systems and in, in the current programming that you have for the facilities with no other improvements. The next aspect of the assessment was uh, WTIs or the pool aquatic specialist. In their assessment tool they've determined that 66.27 percent of the facility has um, a life cycle, uh, the life cycle of the aquatics components has not passed 66.27%. Therefore, you still got a pretty good percentage left in the aquatics component of the uh, system. Um, like many pools that we've assessed in the past, especially for our friends to the south and a little bit west, where the city of Edmonton currently doing Hemingway and Kingsman, um, that's a good and a bad news story. The good news is you've got a lot of life cycle left in the aquatics. The bad news is uh, your building can't handle some of the caustic environment that's produced by the pool. That's why there's a 52% cost to reinvest in the pool. And that's something as a, as a consideration that you would need to go forward. Uh, the other component that I wanted to mention within this summary analysis is it's only a like-for-like -like replacement. Usually because aquatics is a complex program, there are authorities having jurisdiction, including your own at the city, as well as Alberta Health Services, who dictate operational requirements of a pool that may have factors that will initiate additional cost if you choose to do a renovation within this system. Um, the other component is market uncertainty. As you can well appreciate, the cost of reconstruction and renewals are uh, significant. There is significant risk in the marketplace right now that we uh, peg at. Oh yeah, thank you. That we peg at approximately 30% at this point in time, and in a pool facility, those costs can be extreme, especially in a renewal where there is many conditions that you may find uh, rather than examine through analysis or engineering. Um, because of those uncertainties, we've created a, a bit of a complex. Uh, costing structure that also includes this risk 
and that's why you see some of the costs go past the 52% marker, uh, but we've decided to use the, the baseline infrastructure investment between one to five and five to 10 years. Um, at this point in time, uh, we have, based on our findings, three scenarios that we uh, decided to address collaboratively with the team that we're looking for these, uh, for our guidance and recommendation moving forward. Uh, the summary analysis included that there could be a reinvestment within the existing facility, again, a like-for-like -like replacement, which would have a capital cost estimate of $5,276,000, plus a potential uh, authority-mandated uh, cost of around $6,111,400 for a total cost of over $11 million and a 30% risk to move to $14 million. This existing facility replacement, again, is like for like. There are no additions to the system. There are no program changes, and, and there are no other systems benefits that you would drive from that. The second uh, scenario was the reinvestment in the existing facility with small mechanical enhancements that were brought to our attention through the WTI assessment. In other words, uh, that increased our capital initial cost to $7.7 million, and the code authority mandated costs, if necessary, again, are still $6.11 million to reach a total cost of 13.8. And again, using a risk contingency of 30%, those costs move to 19 million or just over $19 million. Um, our third scenario is to reinvest in a new facility. Uh, we use some benchmark uh, information that we've received through the City of Edmonton as well at over $7,300 a square meter. I know there are some pools that have come in just over $8,000 a square meter, but based on the current program and footprint that you have at Harbor Pool, uh, we believe that that replacement cost is just over $17 million with a smaller risk of 15% to reach $20 million. Um, one of the uh, key Actually, I'd like to just move back to talk a little bit about the uh, code-mandated uh, uh, work. Uh, I'll do it through an example if I can. We're recently renewing Hemingway Pool. Uh, for those of you who are a little bit older like me, it used to be called Coronation Pool. Uh, we started with an envelope or a facility upgrade, which is similar to what we see in your investment of $5 million here identified in the uh, Harbor Pool. Uh, we quickly found out by the authority having jurisdiction that they deem this a major renovation. Once they deemed it a major renovation, then all code compliance was necessary. Once they mandated that code compliance was necessary, Alberta Health Services uh, stepped in to ensure that the operation of the pool uh, was made mandatory, or the compliance was made mandatory. And what that means is uh, exchange rates of water, filtration, valve sizing, surge tanks, uh, anti-entrapment, bonding of metal components must be upgraded and at Hemingway that came over three to five million dollars as a cost to uh, the project itself. So as a result through no other condition of the pool or the pool equipment itself uh, we required to do a major renovation to the aquatics where we stripped the pool down to its structure. Uh, therefore we increased cost and we increased time to complete and I'm sure as a council you're aware of uh, taking the pool programming space down for an extended period of time. Uh, so my apologies, I just wanted to mention that. Uh, so what does that mean to us in terms of takeaways? Um, I can tell you that uh, in our estimation, in, in our review, uh, the building has been maintained well, the aquatics has been maintained well, and could operate uh, into the future with investment from uh, this authority. And again, the investment would be for a like-for-like -like replacement. Um, maintaining the existing, fa existing facility on a like-for-like -like basis could cost somewhere between 15 and $19 million between uh, the one to five priority spend that we've identified, the five to 10 year spend that we identified, and the spend beyond 10 years, including the aquatics and perhaps the upgrades required by the Alberta or the authority having jurisdiction. jurisdiction. And then replacing the facility on a like-for-like -like basis would cost you generally around $20 million if you had the same program space, if you required any improvements or adding footprint to the program, then uh, cost per area would apply and that cost could be uh, greater than the projected $20 million today. So in, 
so in terms of next steps, uh, we'll continue to work with RC Strategies as the principal lead on this project uh, to complete sections two and three of the uh, indoor recreation service level review. Uh, and the next step in that would be to come back with the public indoor recreation survey results that were um, gathered uh, last month. Yeah, uh, that will help inform the facility program as a next step. And we expect to bring this forward to council in late March. That concludes our presentation. We welcome any questions you may have. Great, thank you very much for the presentation. If there's one thing I learned at all, it was the word natatorium for as the definition of a pool or correct uh, engineering terminology. Uh, so thank you for being here today. I'll open up the floor uh, for questions and we will begin with Mayor Catcher. Here we are, thank you. you Kind of touch. Hold on one second here. Yes, we apologize. Right. Okay, we'll try that. And everybody else has to uh, put their speaker things on again. That's you got right. bumped out. Um, so you touched on it just a little bit. So you talk about the operations of this. Uh, uh, you know, doing the uh, renovation of it, doing the, you know, like to like one and building a new one um, in the first two options. So I guess I question when, when it's coming back uh, with information um, for council to make a decision, there should be a time frame put in that if either section one or two options, scenario one or two are put in, how much, uh, how much time that pool would be closed for and the impact on the community. So that's something that I would see as feedback uh, coming back. Um, a second. Okay. Um, I'll leave it with that for now. I may come back. Okay. Thank you. All right. Councillor Macon. Can I put Councillor Richelli in? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Councillor Abatoye. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I thought this was very, the report was very well done. And um, my first question is around um, the report you have, the FCI, Facility Condition Index. Um, so a lot of the items you have for under five years are architectural um, issues, right? And there's just one structural <laughs> issue that falls under under five years. So does that then mean that um, for, for, for the next five years, we're good to continue to operate the pool as is? Because architectural will be like design, right? So maybe not a major issue, but structural will be a major issue. So um, in your expert's experience, would you say that the next five years, we're good to continue to operate the pool as is? Uh, uh, through you, uh, Councillor Noy and uh, Councillor, uh, that would be a good assessment. Uh, our examination, although thorough, doesn't take into account any conditions that you can't see substructure. Uh, post, uh, post that investigation, uh, we were uh, in discussion with the team. We also did what's known as a chaining or a sounding of the basin where you simply take a chain and you sound the tiles and if they sound like they're hollow there could be delamination of the tile which means water gets into the substrate mm -hmm. uh, we actually completed that and we found that approximately 20 to 30 percent of the tiles would be delaminating including over 80 percent in the current hot tub program space so although there shouldn't be anything that's catastrophic there could be conditions over the next five years which may require you to pay uh, immediate attention to that uh, to the structure of the pool basin or foundation, as well as the other program space like okay. the hot tub in, in, uh, as an example. Okay, thank you. Um, so just two quick questions. So um, the assumption of replacement, is that assuming in the same location as is? Because it doesn't, like you said, it doesn't take into consideration tear down on all of that. Uh, yeah, through, uh, through yourself, Mr. Chairman, Councillor, uh, we didn't specify a location, but we would assume that this would be an alternate location. We did not include costs for demolition. Uh, we did not include costs as an additional to the existing space, um, because simply if you do, this, if, if you do the, the math, Councillor, uh, if you're adding program to the existing program, you still have to renew the existing old facility, and that would be, uh, again, something that would have to be um, 
stopped or the program would have to stop so you can renew it and add on to it. So I would assume that it would be an addition to a location elsewhere. So my final question, Mr. Chair, if that's okay, um, just a, a little clarification on the reports um, on risk capital. So you had said in your report that um, a significant repairs to Harbour Pool poses risk capital. Um, and on page nine of your reports, um, it will be the... Um, what you said about risk capital, they says risk capital based on replacements will be normalized to a new build 15%, half of the risk capital to renewal. What does that mean? Uh, again, through you, Mr. Chair, Councillor, uh, what that means is in our experience doing work for similar municipalities on renewals or replacements or modernizations, renovations of pools, we find that there's conditions that we don't understand until you uh, replace the product. And as such, we feel that 30% of any capital put aside for that renewal should be identified as risk. For better term, it's normally called contingency. When you're doing a greenfield build, most of the information or conditions that are unknown to you can be found prior to the design completion and the construction, so the risk for found conditions would be less. Yeah, no, okay, I understand that. That's just the contingency you, you had in your table. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank right, you. Thank you. All right, thank you. We'll go on and move to Councillor Harris. Um, question. Um, so you guys have excluded architectural design fees and things of that nature in these estimates, correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. So those would normally range, what, about 20% uh, of capital chair, cost? Chair, Councillor Harris, uh, uh, the recommendation we got was a minimum of 10%. Minimum uh, of 10. Yeah. So not 20, as you indicated, but 10% for design, as well as 2 to 3% for administration on top of that. Okay. So going forward, uh, that is a cost that needs to be looked at and, and line-itemed so that we get a true representation of the capital costs. Um, so I, I, I just say that that's something important to me. I mean, you can't deal with that in exclusion to all of the other costs that come in, into play here. Uh, anyways, so that's just, I say, by way of as a, as a caveat from my standpoint in terms of information that's required. Um, so what I was looking for, I guess, in this whole thing, and we said it when we had the council discussion, um, we wanted to look at the fact that Harbor Pool is a good facility. You have ultimately ascertained that with your uh, performance ratings, and I, I get that. I was anticipating that we would look at whether or not there is a, an opportunity to actually reinvest in the existing footprint. Um, we just put a million and a half or more uh, into the universal change room and other improvements that we put into there. So ultimately to build like for like somewhere else would appear to me to be a little bit kind of confusing as opposed to making an investment respecting the fact, like you said, the risk capital and all those other things we don't know yet would be something we'd have to consider. So was that given to you? Uh, so I, I was trying to give you a sense of where it's come from. Was that gauged to you in relation to what some of our concerns were in terms of like for like or reinvestment in existing footprint as opposed to going out and building a whole brand new thing somewhere else? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Harris, uh, that was part of the discussion, but on page nine, we tried to kind of summarize it is without actually knowing what the program, like the functional program will be, it's hard to assess what we'd actually have to build in terms of the size of the facility or the amenities. Um, so there has been some work that were part of the review uh, looking at the site and gave, I think it was in 2018, but without greater clarity exactly what the build is, to what size, what kind of things are going in it. And then to look at mechanical, do you have to build a separate essentially mechanical system where you integrate it? Like a lot of those details we don't have yet. And so that's where I think the work through section two, where we actually see what the needs assessment is and what we ultimately want that pool to be, uh, whether it's, or sorry, the program to be and determine whether it makes sense that we could expand upon it in the Harbor pool or go strictly to the DCC is kind of what we want to get out of section three of the report in terms of what would the concepts look like for that. Uh, but we kind of need a greater sense, I think, of what we're actually going to build there to know if we can build it. Yeah. Have you ever done, the last question that goes along the line, have you done um, an assessment and a costing on a project that would look kind of what I was just describing? We keep it where it is, 
we pull off the pool and the programming is swimming lessons, adult swim, aqua size, hot tub. You define uh, uh, just the current level of what those services are. Have you done that? Have you actually done that uh, on a facility and rebuilt a new around existing infrastructure with new infrastructure attached to it? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, Councillor, uh, I'm going to answer this in a in a in a roundabout way, uh, and that is we we have done those in the past, and if there are minor uh, uh, renewals of the system, then it was easy to add program where site allowed us to ask to add program. But I'll answer it differently. At Hemingway, we started off with a 3.8 million dollar budget, which escalated to 16 because we had to replace the entire outside glass of the facility and envelope. Uh, and once that happened, we became a renewal of the entire system and operations to meet code. We're currently at $29 million, and it's not a big facility. Therefore, the question was, can we mothball it and build a new one? And that would have been the direction, unfortunately, Hemingway, not unfortunately, sorry, uh, Hemingway is a historic site. So the investment had to take place in that facility, and they're down a tank. So a tank in that area was important mm -hmm. to keep. If not, the answer that I would give you is it would have been a renewal and our project would have stopped dead in its tracks. Thanks. Uh, replacement, sorry. Thanks. All right, thank you. We'll move on to Councillor Macon. Thank you. Um, thanks for the report. I found it really uh, quite interesting, actually, and just working my way through the different areas, it's pretty easy to see how the effect of that new code has on the project and how the price can escalate so fast. Um, first, a super technical question. Um, I just wasn't sure what unsounding tile meant when I was reading that section. <laughs> if you could explain that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, Councillor, sounding is simply, it's a very simple process. It's not very technical. Uh, in terms of machinery, uh, we took about a, a, a length of two meters of chain uh, that I recently bought at the Home Depot uh, two days before we went. Uh, it was kind of heavy. And then you uh, snake it around the uh, area of the basin and the deck of the pool. And you know and you can hear through the sound that it makes whether the tiles are adhered to the deck or the structure, which is the concrete, or if the tiles sound hollow and tinny, which means that the tiles have delaminated or come apart from its, for lack of a better term, its grout or its cementitious layer. When the tiles sound hollow and tinny and the tiles have delaminated from the surface of the structure, it means water's getting in. That's all it means. Okay. And when water gets in, water is caustic, chlorination is salt-based, uh, salt erodes concrete, concrete then rusts the rebar that's in the structure of the pool. Uh, you'll see it sometimes if you go to a pool where you know you have a steel ladder going into the basin you'll see some rusting where it connects to same idea so when we sounded it we determined that about 20 to 30 percent of the of the area of the pool and the deck was delaminating or could have been delaminated and again in the hot tub area there was a significant percentage but because it's a small footprint it still makes up the 20 to 30 percent counselor Right. Um, okay. So my next question then would be, and thank you for that response. Um, if, for example, we decided to go with uh, a new pool site with a different build, whether it's like this or expanded, um, and we're looking at keeping Harbor Pool, if that was the case, um, the different um, time frames that you gave for when the repairs would have to be done, if the pool was having less intense use than it has right now say like it wasn't doing public swim and we were simply doing lanes or exercise or even just lessons um would those time frames change substantially or the 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 change in that time frame would be uh insignificant uh through you mr chair counselor uh excellent question um unfortunately the the and i'm not a pool expert so i'm gonna I'm going to pretend I'm doing uh, listening to the TED talk that uh, WTI would have given me, and that is use of the system only uh, impacts or, or, or day use or, or swim times or whatever only impacts the facility itself. The balance of the aquatics doesn't change. Your your aquatics will still do the same 2.25 or 2.5 changeovers that it currently does. So uh, it is still a caustic environment, and the degradation of the systems, whether they're components, equipment, or structure, will still continue. Uh, the other part that I will mention, not from the perspective of fear, 
But even though we address the fact that the authority having jurisdiction as well as the operational authority, Alberta Health Services, would mandate if they deem this a major renovation to comply to their codes, it doesn't mean that one year from now they'll, they'll ask you to comply to their codes. Uh, one is just uh, something that could initiate that uh, request. In certain cases, they can in initiate that independently once they've reached a certain level of understanding. So, uh, you know, although it wasn't particularly, I just wanted to make that a, a known fact because those things do occur. And again, they've, they've happened before, uh, for sure, with the City of Edmonton that we've worked with before. Awesome. Thank you so much. Right, we'll move to Councillor Blizzard. Thanks for your presentation. Lots of good information there. Um, when you're talking the 15 to 19 million like-for-like like replacement, um, it, first of all, is that imminent? Like, is that something we're looking at in five to ten years, or are we taking our chances by not doing something sooner? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor, um, imminence are rather... Uh, a daunting term, right? I, I don't believe anything's ever catastrophic, uh, but it's certainly, uh, uh, think of it this way, you're certainly living on borrowed time, and after 40 years, you've amortized this uh, natatorium quite well. So I think without investing in it, it just keeps degrading. And, and uh, like any other program space, uh, uh, again, the example that I can uh, let you know is Fountain Park Pool uh, in St. Albert. Uh, they were doing a renewal and found a catastrophic failure in their deck where it was going to come apart. Uh, that added a significant amount of money counselor and shut their pool down for an additional 9 to 12 months. Now there's only service place which can't handle its capacity. So in, in essence, if something were to happen, uh, you'd be left without a program here at the city. So deferring that maintenance is not a good thing. Uh, allowing for the investment would be uh, something that we'd certainly recommend. It is our first recommendation to you. But if you choose to replace the system, I don't believe you would have to re you invest that value of money immediately. You'd kind of let it uh, support itself to the best of its ability while you're planning and designing and constructing the next system, which can go a little bit quicker than the timeline we would have for a major renewal of, a, of an existing facility. That, that timeline could be a little bit shorter. Okay, so when we're looking at either of these options, though, you're looking at basically, tear, would it be tearing the inside of the pool apart, almost starting from scratch, so that it, it's like for like, but almost brand new in the end? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, Councillor, that's exactly what it is. You'd be stripping it to the uh, uh, structure. And uh, again, to give you that example, uh, we stripped Hemingway to structure, found out if the structure was usable, uh, it was, and as such, we determined what we could design to. Uh, the examples I'm sure you've heard of Jasper Place Pool and others, when they got to the structure, it was peanut brittle, and then they ended up demolishing the structure and rebuilding the tank system as well, which is one of those found conditions that you see in an aquatics environment uh, that's aged over 30 to 40 years. So uh, that could be an outcome. Okay, and going by that, it's 40 years old. We're looking at doing something. This is our only facility. Um, how long would this take renewing either one of the options, one or two? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, Councillor, I think uh, what you're looking at, uh, uh, and, and I won't talk about the design cycle itself, I think once you're in the ground, you could uh, be there for at least 24 months on a renewal. Uh, again, you will find something that you have not anticipated it's just a fact um, leaking somewhere where you didn't know um, it, it's always a condition that you have to be aware of so uh, your risk uh, of 30 percent is not only in the capital itself your risk is in schedule i agree okay thank you all right i'll move on to councillor kelly and then i'll interject myself and then looks like we have another round of questions uh, thank you, gentlemen. I was, I guess, hoping, and this is the first time I've seen a report like this, but hoping perhaps something a little bit different. Uh, I never imagined that the existing harbor pool, for instance, would be completely repaired to an as-new status. I, I, I can't imagine how that would make sense in any respect, in any, in any possible scenario. So, my take on this 
is that Fort Saskatchewan as a community is in a state of flux. Uh, we're a rapidly growing community. We're what, 27,000 people now and, and we will hit probably 40 in the next 10 years at least. So given that, and, and, and the understanding, I guess, that it's, a, it's important to do something like this right the first time. Um, this isn't the first report that I've read that suggested that perhaps harbor pool design was, was flawed before it was even built. So if we were to buy some time as a community, let's talk, first of all, buying five years. Let's talk about buying 10 years. And then let's talk about buying 15 years. What in your schedule of items that you've indicated would have to occur to buy the community five years of use of the pool and no more? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, Councillor, um, you, you caught me a little bit uh, with without some information. I don't have the report in front of me. I see Brad does. But our one to five year investment uh, is uh, is critical uh, based on uh, the information we receive from the assessment of the aquatics basin and the structure itself. Uh, that's about three point one four five million dollars. Uh, on the aquatic side, uh, it's approximately $2 million within that one to five period. So we're looking at around $5 million and change to keep it going over that, uh, over that uh, cycle. Once you get past the five, uh, uh, the five year, or sorry, the five to 10 year at 3.14, there's only an additional 390000 that you would have to add over 10 years, Councillor. So uh, that's the level of investment that we're looking into the system itself, both for the facility and then the aquatics, if I'm not mistaken, is around $2 million in change. Just a second. Um, you just confused me with your with your last statement. Um, we got $5.2 million, and then you said something about a, aquatics at $2 million in change. Is that not, you meant, did you mean the code? Yeah, Councillor, sorry, there, there is, sorry, just to be clear, we're 1.7 for inside of five years, 3.145 added to that to five and 10, and then the additional 380 after 10 years for a total uh, expenditure of $5.245 million for uh, the facility itself. Um, okay, thank you. So that, now I just wanted to touch upon this, this code authority stuff that, that you've referred to it would seem to me that not much of this should come as a surprise. In other words, the city ought to know ahead of embarking on, let's say we're at year six and we're talking about spending another three and a half million dollars on the pool to expend, extend its life for five more years. Before we spent the first one dollar, we should have an understanding of what our code requirements are and whether or not the three million would need to be budgeted as six million to meet code requirements. There shouldn't be a surprise in there. Um, help me understand that. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, Councillor, that uh, you are exactly right. Uh, we would have to work with the City of Fort Saskatchewan's uh, code authority or authority having jurisdiction in your plans examination, outlining the exact scope of work for the renewal program. In our experience, Councillor, we find that the HJs uh, would normally deem that as a major modernization and as such would en uh, enact the fact that all conditions of code compliance must be met. Once the authority identifies that counselor, then they would initiate the same uh, information exchange with Alberta Health Services. Once they find out they are guideline only, the authority has that jurisdiction. So once they enact uh, use of their guidelines to upgrade the operations to meet current conditions, that's when that's when we would know. But I, I, I do believe that we could have that discussion uh, with the current uh, administrative branch of the city to determine if that's the case. Again, in our experience, we believe that that, w in essence, would be the case. I'm looking to understand. Um, so let me summarize what I think I heard, and, and you can tell me whether I'm right or not. Up to five years at under $2 million dollars, we probably do not have code significant issues. Is that correct? Yes, under two million, we don't believe that the AHA would force us to uh, 
uh, upgrade all code and bylaw and uh, HS operational requirements. Okay, then what in the next $3.2 million would trigger a code violation? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, Councillor, we believe that once the scope of work extends to include uh, facility envelope, facility mechanical, facility electrical, where permitting is required for all those changes, then that's when we believe that the authority would ask us to comply for all code and operational requirements. I would, I would, uh, to make it really easy, I would, I would ask you to think of this perhaps as doing an internal or interior renovation as opposed to doing major structural repair to a to a facility. Well, okay, thank you. Uh, I'm not going to take more of your time. I'm going to, at this this particular juncture, Mr. Chair, I'm going to think about this and uh, put me on the list for the second go. Thank you. Okay, we'll do. Thank you very much. And I'll interject myself right now. So I did have some questions about um, what administration or administration managing uh, our facilities maybe has planned out of what we've seen in this report for the next year or two years. Is, is there anything major that we have for uh, like the infrastructure of our aquatics facility that we didn't know about through the d discovery in this report, would you say? Or Uh, through your, well, to the chair, uh, the facility side, uh, I'm not as strongly, uh, I don't understand that as well, but I think we do have a pretty strong asset management program in terms of our aquatic pool mechanical. So we definitely do have some investments coming in the near term. Um, we did recognize that the pool tile was a significant cost coming forward. Uh, so that's one we definitely knew about, um. I don't think, I think the other pieces around facilities, mostly about the building and the parking lot and some of those uh, weren't on my radar in terms of the actual operations. Uh, and I can't recall off the top of my head about if uh, facilities had that in there or not. Okay, that, that's good enough. And I, I appreciate your response to that. I'm just trying to gauge what, uh, you know, what we're, we're looking at based on the report that's given to us as, as necessity for repairs of this building versus what we already have, you know, and are, are going to be working towards if, if we do nothing at, the, at this point uh, of the game. Um, I had one, one specific question just in regards to a, uh, one, one aspect of the pool. So you talked about the metal roof uh, going to need repair more than uh, maintenance, I suppose. And can you walk me through the rationale of why we would need that? I think it's the metal cladding around around the sides as well that was included in that. Uh, it looks like there's there's paint that's peeling, and obviously that can lead to rust with a, a steel product. By is is there you know an alternative if if we wanted to look at rejuvenating that that part of the building? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, because it's envelope again of an aquatics or natatorium facility and the environment inside is caustic, uh, the repair or in best practices repair of those envelope requirements are never done as a one-off. It's usually the entire system that is something that we look at both architecturally and from a roofing perspective. So when those, uh, the condition is primarily when those two planes meet, a wall and a roof, it's that connection piece that's the critical piece, and that's the part where, in examination, we feel is going to be uh, uh, an area which will need to be renewed or replaced or repaired based on that. All right. Okay. And that's that's kind of what I figured. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to Councillor Harris. A couple of questions. Um, looking into the future, say when we reach the thirty-five to 40,000 population threshold, and I'm looking at the gentleman from RC, is it safe to say that communities of that size typically would have two aquatic or two pool related facilities, whether it's something like Millennium Place and something like Kinsman Pool in Sherwood Park? You know, they've got obviously then they've got uh, the one um, uh, near the uh, uh, senior high school, Catholic school. Is it safe to say that we would probably be needing to have two facilities to meet our population demand at that point in time in that population context? Uh, through the chair to the councillor, uh, very good question. I would say that it's um, it's more about the program of or the level of service or the program that you want to hit rather than there being one or two or, or three facilities. I can guarantee you that as you get larger, um, 
you will need more, right? That's intuitive. You'll need more of certain types of amenities, not just aquatics, but everything else. Uh, whether it manifests itself in one facility or two, I, I would say I'm not, we're the closest thing to a having an authoritative opinion on that, I guess, being recreation consultants. And I would say that I wouldn't make that statement that at 40,000, you would need to have two separate facilities. It's all a question of what makes up two facilities or one or three. And the thing that actually um, works its way into that question now more so than it has even in the past 10 years is the escalating costs of doing anything right now. Um, and there can be cost savings, uh, having everything under one roof, if you were, you know, to try to meet a lot of aquatics needs under one roof, which, you know, might um, render a different result than a community that made decisions at a different time to build more than one facility. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but I'll, I'll liken it to a project that we're working on in Regina right now. Um, they uh, had to replace an existing 50 meter pool. It was just a 50 meter pool and they see this opportunity of investment as their opportunity to meet both current and future needs. Um, very deficient kind of uh, aquatics area already. And they've decided to create uh, like probably what will be the biggest single indoor aquatics site, one of the biggest ones in Canada, uh, if they can source the funds to do so. Their council is um, making decisions on that right now. But they did that uh, with the, I guess, logic or understanding that by putting as much as they can at that one site, they would be saving some capital and some operational costs for doing it. So. I think the, the answer is there isn't like a, a standard or a legislation out there, obviously, that says you need one or two pools, but it's more about how much capacity you'll need uh, at 40,000. Yeah, and that's kind of where I'm coming from, because when we started this conversation, I looked at the standpoint as I don't think we're at the point where as a community of 27,000, that we can afford to drop $60 million into a new aquatic facility even though we've just come through paying the debenture off in the DCC, I don't think we're at that point to be able to pay for it. So my thought process was what is a reasonable amount looking at uh, section 6.7 in terms of potential enhancements, does it make sense to make a strategic investment that we can, we can debenture over a shorter period of time so that by the time we reach that population threshold of 40,000, 35, whatever it is, and that's why I asked that question, we could then make a strategic investment in a much larger, more comprehensive aquatic facility that I know a number of my colleagues up here think we're ready for right now. I beg to differ. But to make a strategic investment that we can pay off from a debt standpoint, debt finance, smart debt, have the harbor pool as the number one or two facility in the population threshold that I was asking you about, that's what I'm trying to come to grips with. So if we look at uh, section 6.7, the potential enhancements, are those the things that you say that we could do? If we could pay for them in cash, that'd be great. If not, we'd debenture it. And then that would get us well into the future with the harbor pool and the envelope and all the things that we would have to do that would take us another 30 years into the future on that facility. That's what I'm trying to grip, uh, grapple with, to try to make an intelligent decision about the future of aquatics in our community. And I respect that the programming is, is the um, kind of the albatross, what we're trying to put a, put a, a de definition on. Uh, because Millennium Place is totally different than the Kinsman Pool, is totally different than uh, the em one in the north side of Sherwood Park. Emerald Hills, yeah. yeah. Emerald Hills. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. And some of your analysis has given me some some feeling of comfort. And then there's these big question marks in the eye, in the air. Can we get to where we don't have so many big question marks relative to what you've analyzed going forward? Are we at that point? What more do we have to do? Uh, through the chair. Um, so I mentioned I've been doing this for 20 years. And the first pool I worked on was the High Prairie Pool. And it started at $2.4 million. And that was during the feasibility stage. And by the time it was actually built, it was $5.2 million. 
So that was the first major shift that we saw in the capital cost, I guess, inflation related to these facilities. And that was back when I did that first report for Harbor Pool back in the early 2000s. And I've seen at least two others, if not three other major shifts like that in capital construction costs related to pools or any other rec facilities that have never retracted. So it's hard to think about a pool at $60 million dollars Right now, it could very well be 40 to 60 is kind of, you know, what you might expect even a regular, not extravagant, extravagant pool to be. Not a like-for-like like replacement of Harbor Pool, for sure, which I appreciate what the councillor said. That wouldn't be recommended, but it was important to look at it to try to give you this one piece of information about the difference between reinvesting or building new. But out of all of those shifts in the construction market that I've seen, the costs have never gone down and they surprise everybody. <laughs> Obviously, they surprise the construction industry, they surprise architects and they surprise recreation planners just as much as they surprise decision makers that have to make the decisions to, to move forward. So I think the, the shock of how many numbers or how many zeros are behind the numbers now or decimal points or however you want to look at it I don't think that that's going to go away and um, you could uh, invest you know a smaller amount retain the current service level that you have um, but you're creating I guess you know a, a potential for another capital cost headache that might not be let's say it was 60 million today it might be 80 million in the five or 10 years that, that you wait. I, it's ridiculous to me how much costs increase <laughs> every time that we get one of these major shifts, but it is what it is. It's not like you can shop around. You, you put a tender out and it comes back and it almost always surprises people and it's never less than what you originally expect. So I don't know if that uh, helps counselor or not. These aren't easy decisions that have to be made. But the one thing that we will have for you next time we're in front of you is an idea of what we think the community needs now um, in terms of aquatics, but also what it will need when it hits 40 and you know beyond in terms of population. And we'll try to show that in the concepts. And we'll also try to show that as an addition to or an expansion of Harbor Pool or what it could look like on uh, addition to another facility or maybe even as a standalone yeah. new building if, if we're pro progressing along a path and you're going to bring that information and help to analyze or put it in a context that we can actually use for decision making this is a condition assessment and you've given us some potential cost i get it if there's another step along the process that we're going to see so that this group of seven people here with the help of our administration and you as advisors, can help us make that decision so that we can grow accordingly and meet the needs of our community at a reasonable cost over a period of time, then I'll be happy. That's what I'm looking for, All and right. that's what I expect. Excellent. Thank I you. think that's the entire intent of the process, so I'll move on to Mayor Katcher. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So the question that I have as I'm listening to all of this, um, there's been a lot of questions about um, the longevity of the pool and is it good for the next five years? So I guess the question that I have coming out of that is you indicate it, yeah, it's probably good for the next five years. But I guess the first question that comes out of that is how long does it take to uh, design, tender, and build a new pool? That's the first question. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, your worship, uh, just give me the contract and get it done right away. No, uh, uh, especially at 20, no. Uh, so usually a design process depends on the engagement that is driven by the administration, but uh, in normal in normal conditions uh, for a renewal or a replacement, uh, you're probably looking at a 16 month process, maybe a little longer with engagement for design and engineering and production documentation that's tendered. And then again, uh, construction, if it's a renewal, uh, you hope to get it done in 24 months, maybe a little bit longer unless you have found conditions. If it's a new build, um, not that it's through 
any level of confidence in this environment through risk, supply chain issues, and cost management, uh, you should be able to do it for a little less than 24 months, depending on the program that you have. If you if you were to double the program space, if Mike and his team says you're missing all these program requirements, let's put them in now uh, a little bit a little bit longer for a little bit bigger pool. But if it's a like for like, I think that's a reasonable expectation. Okay, so once council made a decision on which way they're going, so one, so they're both around that 24 months then, or the other one was 19 months plus 24 months? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Your Worship, I think if it's a renewal, I think you'd have to be longer than 24 months just on construction, and then perhaps uh, 12 to 16 months on design, depending on the uh, complexity of the engagement that we'd have to do if there was additional program space. I think the other one, if it's greenfield build, you could probably be, uh, save about four to six months okay. from that. And I guess I asked that question because I guess I asked that because if you do new build versus uh, trying to repair, so A, you wouldn't have downtime or uh, on, on your existing pool. But I guess I just, 24 months seems like a fairly, fairly uh, short time frame. Um, anyway, uh, the other question that I have is on the existing harbor pool building. So if council made the decision, just hypothetically, to go with the new build, you know, once everything's been presented and everything, does the building at Harbor Pool itself, if it were not to be a pool, could it be revitalized for something else? Uh, through the chair to your worship, uh, that is one of the actual components of the Section 3 work is to look at what Harbor Pool could be if it was the, or sorry, what the Harbor Pool building envelope could be if it was decommissioned as a pool to see what other opportunities it might provide to the community if it was uh, deemed worthy to continue investing in. Okay. And can you just remind us, because people are watching and that maybe haven't read the report, what's the time frame on when step two is coming, step three is coming, and decision time? Yeah, absolutely. So we've currently started the second part of the work, which began with the public engagement. Uh, RC Strategies is also working on other pieces of the Section 2, which actually, I think, partially addresses some of the questions Councillor Car um, Councillor Harris had around, like, understanding the whole context of our population. Uh, it's also going to look at the regional inventory we have uh, in terms of other communities and what assets they have in terms of pools. It'll also be looking at trends and leading practices. Uh, not only from an operations perspective, or sorry, not only from a program perspective, but an operations perspective. So obviously 40 years since we built the Harbor Pool, there's been a lot of efficiencies um, in terms of equipment and other ways in terms of operations potentially. Uh, so that would be looked at. So those pieces are all, uh, so the survey will come next month. Yes, in March. Uh, and then the facility program we're hoping to have uh, no later than April. Uh, and then the final component would be to, if the recommended uh, facility program is approved by council, essentially, in terms of it's what they envision or want to consider, uh, then concepts would be developed. And that would determine uh, what would one pool look like, what would a harbor pool and an addition look like, uh, along with, as you mentioned earlier, looking at the timelines associated with that. I think part of the work in terms of the engagement part, we're getting done through our section, our public engagement phase already. So that would help, I think, reduce or potentially uh, reduce some of the timelines uh, that would be needed for informing the design piece. Uh, but so by the end of summer, we would hope to have this all completed and brought forward to council. Okay. Okay. I'm good. Thanks. Thank you. And next we have Councillor Kelly. Thank you. Um, just, I want to support the comments that, that Councillor Harris made um, and, and perhaps build a little bit on, on, I think, the concerns raised by Mayor Catcher. And that's getting a proper time frame for this. I think we're looking at a minimum of five years, regardless of what path we take. And presumably, or possibly, we could extend this out to a 10 to 15 year time or 10 to 15 year time horizon if um, if harbor pool was was sufficient to handle our needs for the next 7 years for instance so i look forward to the next stages in this in this process 
Um, I'm going to, I guess, perhaps put you folks on notice that I'm going to be looking for some recommendations and rationale. I truly don't feel like I'm equipped to handle decisions of this nature without without some guidance and you're the experts. So please come prepared to give us some options and the rationale behind each option as we progress through this, this process. And uh, we'll try to do as a council the very best we can for the entire community. Uh, I think that's also important. It's the entire community we have to think about, not just a subset that actually uses the pool, but the entire community that is tasked in part with paying for the pool. So, so I look forward to the next stages, just giving you a heads up that my questions I think will become much more pointed as we, as we flow through this. And I appreciate your, your, your candor and your information provided today. Thanks gentlemen. Okay, thank you. I, I just have one question, one final question about uh, maybe comparators. Uh, have, we, have we seen a similar size municipality with a similarly aged facility as, as Fort Saskatchewan? It doesn't have to be in Alberta, but you're the experts. You have experience in this field. You might see all across Canada, even the U.S., where there has been a pool of its age. And then a new pool was built and they tried to maintain uh, the existing old pool and and my, my question, I guess, is what the usership of that facility would have been. Is that a scenario that exists that we know that you know about? Uh, to the chair, good question. I can't think of one off the top of my head right now. Um, the city of Vernon just passed a referendum to build a new pool and they have an existing pool that would be around the same age as your yeah. facility. But I would also say that their existing pool is actually ha it has more amenity more feature than what you have with the harbor pool right now from a user experience perspective so their i guess their bar with their older pool was set a bit higher um and they are looking to uh replace and i don't know if they've decided to keep their existing pool open or not yet it's part of their next stage but i can't think of an actual example off the top of my head and, and that's fair and there, there's probably not going to be a, you know an exact let's call it like for like with another municipality but i, I see miss gowie um through your worship um to the chair we do have a couple of examples that have been pulled um in camrose for example i don't have participation data i just have construction data um camrose um they they had a 1979 build and they did an addition originally at a cost of 17.2 million and it escalated to 24 because of found conditions um cochrane uh was down for 20 there was a new build 26 months uh 48 million uh canmore 2013 new build at uh 39 million uh, Drayton Valley, uh, 18 months new build, 21.2. Lac La Biche, uh, estimated opening 2025, September, 27 million. So just a few examples. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you for that. Uh, we'll move to Councillor Blizzard. So our pool being 40 years old, I have to say thanks to the council of the day, I guess, that approved the pool going in at the time, because I do believe it was oversized for maybe what was necessary for the 11 to 12,000 people that would have lived there. Um, when I moved here in 93 and walked in the pool, I was blown away. I just was thoroughly impressed. It was an amazing pool. Population at the time was 12 and a half thousand. We're two and a half times that size now. Um, with the increase in uh, population, I definitely know that we are struggling with getting some of the programming filled because I see it on some of the social media that I kind of just keep an eye on. People having trouble getting their kids in. I never had that issue in the 90s. Um, but anyways, uh, my question is, do we, for our population, we're going on 30,000 now, is that a size of pool that is small? You must see other pools. I've been in a few. I was in Camrose's one years ago before their recent addition. Um, but, you know, I don't know other pools. Is this a normal size pool for 30,000? Is this what you would say is a cramped pool for 30,000 small? Uh, through the chair, good, good question. And... Um... I'll answer it to some degree, but I'll also defer a lot of the material that'll help you uh, with that question to our next presentation. 
where we talk about function and current um, kind of current and expected use or demand for the facility. I would say that a rule of thumb in aquatic planning right now, especially if you have the luxury of starting from scratch uh, with a new development, but even in renovation, in the case of renovations, is that we, we um, typically see about seven different types of activities that you'd want to happen in a public pool. And you want to design your facility to be able to host as many of those concurrently as possible, which gets your usership up. Uh, you can think of it as a cost per visit or however you want to however you want to think of it but you want to get as much use out of the pool busy times or dead times as you possibly can which means you would design it in a way uh, I would say differently than what the configuration of harbor pool is right now just because it doesn't allow for as much of that multi-use capability as a new pool would um, which could mean multiple tanks or it just means a different type of configuration or feature to it but I don't want to say any more than that right now and I can guarantee you that we'll have lots of content for you at our next presentation about the functionality of the pool and about future potential future demand the best that we can um, articulate that for you okay I'll look forward to seeing that through the chair to Council Blizzard I just add one more piece yeah we've asked them to look at five other similar size communities and the building like the number of pools, the amenities, size of the, I guess the volume of water uh, for direct comparison to give you guys that information when you're evaluating things going forward. Okay, thank you. Hey, thanks. Uh, we'll move to Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you. It just occurred to me, I just wanted to follow up, I guess, on, on a comment that was made by one of the presenters earlier during a, his, his reflection on escalating costs, you weren't suggesting by your comments that we should consider building now just to save money and costs 10 years from now? I would hope you weren't. I threw the chair to the councillor. I, I it wasn't meaning to suggest anything out of it, just that that's an observation that, um, that I've had is it, costs go up and there are there have been in the course of my career like two or three I wouldn't call them corrections but major jolts I guess to the construction market that have created what seems to be an astonishing level of investment required to build a facility that's happened it's probably going to happen again in in my career once or twice and we are just coming off the back end of one of those jolts uh, I would say last year and again I'm not a cost consultant but Every time I talk to an architect or uh, even a community that's built anything, I hear that it was at least a 30% increase last year. So the comment was just to say, and, and I, I get what you're, where you're coming from, and I know that it would sound like that. And, and maybe in some ways I was trying to make it sound like that, that costs will always go up. Um, but, uh, yeah, I guess... More the point was 60 million today is not what 60 million was, say, 10 years ago. And I think you'll be able to look back whenever you make the decision on this, you'll be able to, to look back on it and it'll still seem like an absurd amount of money for what you're getting. Um, and it's, that's just going to be a reality for local government decision makers like you for any projects that you have to make a decision on. So I, I didn't mean to to uh, create an ultimatum or anything like that. So sorry if I did. No, no, I appreciate your comments. Uh, I, the further further color helped. Um, yeah, I look forward to the next stages in this. There's lots of decisions to be made. We can build to accommodate programming, or we can um, sign a, a reasonable budget and and build the programming into what we can afford. So so there's lots of alternative ways to look at this and and stages. The next stages in this should help with, with that, illuminate those options. So look forward to seeing you gentlemen again. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Harris. Clarifying questions? Uh, oh, there we go. One, one last question, Mr. Babiak. Um, you've heard long and long and long, I would imagine, that we have not been able to meet the demand for swimming lessons in our community at the Harbour Pool. 
um, tell me that you're working on a solution to be able to uh, meet the demand within reasonable context uh, in the short term outside of the context of the capital costs that will come up in the discussion relative to new replacement, rehabilitation, whatever it is. Do you have a, an ace up your sleeve relative to helping us be able to meet the demand for swimming lessons in our community? I, uh, through the chair to Councillor Harris, uh, we are having conversations about if there's any opportunities to provide more op or provide more programming or lessons. Um, costing some of those out, whether that be increased staff, increased hours, uh, we'll explore those. But I think um, others in council have brought up, it's not just a question of necessarily opening up more time. There are select times people want their lessons. And so, again, we can't address that because, quite frankly, of the design of our pool, we are limited on where we can teach lessons in it for certain age groups. Uh, and so that's something we can overcome. So the only we'll have to look at those, like you said, other non-design pieces. But there are not a long list of those. To, yeah, to I, yeah, I understand all that. Yeah. And believe me, I've been around long enough. I understand it. I know the uh, the hill you're trying to climb here. But is it safe to assume that there's going to be an opportunity to identify a number of suggestions to improve within the context of our ability to meet that demand with the facility we have that we can put more paid lessons through the harbor pool to meet as much of the demand as we can. That's what I'm looking for. And I'm not going to press you for an answer today, but that's what I'm looking for. And I suspect that to meet the demand in our community, all uh, the, 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 all seven around here want to make sure that we're trying to uh, be able to meet that need. So if you can find a solution to that, that's that's important to all of us, I suspect. All right. Thank you. And yeah, the subject is the Har Harbor Pool Facility Analysis Report. And I have one last question, and, and I don't see any others. And then I believe Council will um, take a short comfort break. Uh, so as you alluded to, uh, one, of, one of the first studies that you did in your professional career was, was in regards to the Harbor Pool. I'm not sure which one that was in 2004. I believe there was a few. Uh, but we have undergone significant studies reports. Uh, how applicable are, are some of the more recent ones to um, to the report that you brought us today, to the analysis of our facility today, and and how much can we use what, what we've already uh, gained from those? I know, I know there was a geotech report that was done that that I still believe would would be valid, and the reason I'm asking about that one in particular is because we're talking about groundwork under tiles, for example. Um. Directly through you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think it's uh, prudent on any council or administration to verify the date of those were said reports. Uh, they do have stale dates, so in the event that you want to continue use of the facility, I believe those third-party assessments still need to be validated. They might they might not have to be redone, but at least validated so that the condition is confirmed. Uh, any other? Uh, reports that you want to talk to. Uh, this is primarily geotechnical, uh, right. hazardous materials, uh, ESAs, uh, reports of that nature. Okay. Mr. Chair, just to uh, confirm, <clears throat> Edo and his team, engineers, WTI and ACI, were all equipped with those reports. So they helped set the context for the review to occur. Um, so I guess you could think of this work being built upon that, but also obviously um, having its own 2022, late 2022 perspective on the current state as well. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And, and thank you all for your presentation and for being here today with us. Um, you can stick around for the rest of our council meeting if you like, but you're free to go. And uh, council will take a 10 minute recess at this point.
So he's going to do that now. Yeah, right now. I'm going to call the meeting. All right, we'll reconvene the, the meeting. Um, so we'll go to item number five, financial reserves policy update. Uh, is everyone here online as well? Okay, and I believe that um, there is a motion in regards to this item. Uh, yes, ahead, Mr. Go. Chairman, I would like to make I would like to make a motion if possible. Okay, please read in your motion. Thank you. I move that item five financial reserves policy be be postponed to a later committee of the whole meeting. Uh, it could be fit in by administration and the chairman at the time um, at an appropriate point in, in the future when the agenda allows. Okay, did you want to suggest that to be postponed until the next committee of the whole meeting just for wording uh, for legislative services to bring the motion forward right now? Uh, good point. I can do that. Yes, thank you. Okay, so as they're drafting that motion then would you like to speak to your motion i would thank you um i allocated several hours over the last long weekend to go through our package i noticed that something seemed to be odd or missing with with the with the materials provided um but it was a long weekend and i we didn't get the, the corrective material until um, sometime this morning, which didn't allow any member of council much time to, to take a look at the additional materials. When I scanned them this morning, it became obvious that the changes proposed are pervasive and in some cases, I think, significant. And I would think that it makes sense for council to have adequate time to prepare so that we could have a wholesome discussion when this material comes forward before us. So it's unfortunate, but stuff happens. So let's move on rather to do a sloppy job or a shop, potentially a shoddy job. Let's delay it till we're all prepared and uh, we can deal with, it in a, in a, deal with it in a professional manner. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is, is there any other councillors? Are there any other councillors that would like to speak to the motion? Oh, sorry. Mayor Catcher. Okay, so it's my understanding on this that it needs uh, two-thirds in order to pass on a postponement motion? That's correct. I, I believe that's confirmed by, okay. by Andrew. Okay, um, so I'm not going to support postponing it at this point in time. I think today is really about receiving feedback and inf or receiving the information, uh, listening to administration, what they've uh, put forward, uh, providing feedback and comments. And then I think at the end of this, if there is a need at that point in time, uh, it could be brought back to another committee of the whole. But I would really like to hear what has been uh, prepared at this point in time. So on that basis, I won't be supporting it because I think it's prudent to hear now what we have so that we don't have to have an additional month uh, later. So I'll leave it with that. Okay, thank you, Councillor Harris. Um, so it's safe to say if we receive this uh, report for information today, as was intended, uh, notwithstanding Councillor Kelly's postponement notice, um, that's just one step in the process, similar to the last report we just received, correct? And there's going to be more opportunity to have discussion because, I mean, it's a very complicated process or a very complicated topic, correct? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Harris. So this really was an initial uh, discussion and review with the committee mm -hmm. the whole uh, to go over the proposed revisions um, and accept feedback for a further amendments if needed. Um, and then at some point, once the draft is at a satisfactory state, it will be brought back to a regular council meeting for council's review and adoption. So there is an opportunity for further discussion, whether it would be the next committee of the whole meeting. So if we received it tonight or today, and then we had more discussion, because I can see the opportunity or the need for more discussion on this thing, just to, to peel back layers of the onion, before we get to a, a, a decision point. 
Okay. That's correct. <clears throat> well, yes. if that's the case, then this is nothing more than a step along the path. It's information to share today and to discuss, but not to make a decision, obviously. And so, therefore, I won't support the deferral. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Councillor Macon. Um, thank you. Um, and this might be to the, ch uh, to the chair. I, um, I heard in passing that our next few community the holes are quite full, but I don't know if that's accurate or not. Can either the chair, because you're in those meetings, or somebody else speak to the, what's on the agendas uh, for the next few? Maybe I could defer that to Mr. Fleming. Uh, would there be an opportune time during the <clears throat> next council meeting as the motion, sorry, the, the next committee of the whole meeting as the motion suggests March 21st uh, to include this in, in that, that meeting? Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, to your worship, just I've actually, we spent some time this morning trying to clear some items off of the March 21st committee, the whole agenda, because it was a little full. Um, maybe if it was just friendly to the mover, just ask that it be brought back in March and not specific to that meeting. And then that gives us a little bit of flexibility. Okay. Um, so I guess just based on that, I would say I wouldn't support the motion uh, just with the heavy agenda next time. And uh, like the comments that have been made, I'm happy to uh, start this conversation. If we're looking for more, we can always add additional time. Thank, thank you, Councillor Macon. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to interject myself. There, there are uh, 10, I believe, 10 changes to uh, uh, reserve funds and two new reserve funds. Uh, we could we could go ahead with the discussion today about it. Uh, I would like to see this moved as well, uh, due to how much is is on this policy change. Um, so I'll I'll vote in favor of it for that reason. Go ahead, Councillor Kelly. Yeah, the normal process for our council is committee of the whole, then to council to make a decision. So until I raised my concern, there was no anticipated nor suggested alternative to that process. And we've had council meetings where items have been before our committee of the whole and then came to council and uh, significant changes have been proposed. And in fact, they've been referred back to administration after that process. And I'm looking to avoid that. Um, receiving something for information doesn't really, I don't know how we can have a discussion or provide feedback when we haven't had a chance to digest the information. I, I, I can't say that clear. So unless administration is prepared to propose in front of us right now another date, and I'm good with Mr. Fleming's comments, by the way, it matters not to me whether it comes to a committee of the whole or a council meeting. I just want the opportunity to be prepared so that I can have full understanding and logical input into the discussion and receiving something from information today in anticipation of bringing it back for a fulsome discussion later doesn't make much sense. So, so I, think, I think that the intent is clear. We need to have the opportunity to, as a council to prepare and I'm looking to avoid having this thing come to a council meeting for a decision and being thrashed around in wordsmith and eventually referred back to administration yet again anyway. So so whatever council wishes, um, my motion I think is clear and, and, and um, understandable. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I see we have, oh, that wasn't the close. I see we have one more, one more councillor, councillor Harris. Well, well, just an observation. So committee of the whole, the only reason we have committee of the whole is to receive deliberative information that ultimately um, we would likely make decisions on in a subsequent time. That's what I see this as, is, uh, you know, our administration has prepared some really good information on, on um, reserve. Uh, I, I get that. It's a complicated process. It's important for our future well-being. Uh, but I see that we're going to have to deal with this again. So in that context, Councillor Kelly, 
Uh, I won't support your deferral motion, only insofar as this is an opportunity to start the discussion, to start the review of the information which is near and dear to your heart. Uh, it's going to take more than one meeting. It may take several. Uh, but I don't see the need to put this thing off any further. Let's, let's receive the information and start the discussion. Okay, there are no more councillors on the speaking order, so Councillor Kelly on close. Okay, before I close, and I have a question of administration. Was it anticipated, Troy, that in fact this was step one of a multi-step process for discussion and deliberation? Um, through the chair, typically what we do we, when we bring something like this to Committee of the Whole is we will gauge how the meeting goes and uh, then we kind of decide from there whether or not it comes back to another Committee of the Whole or whether we think it's ready uh, to come to open session for a decision. So um, uh, typically, if we get through the committee of the whole meeting and there was a lot of work and there was a lot of uncertainty, then we would just, that's when we've scheduled to come back to committee of the whole. So we hadn't planned on it, but we don't, we sort of gauge how the meeting goes before we, before we decide on the next step. And I don't want to put you on the spot, Troy, but I will. If I haven't had time to adequately prepare, how would you be in a position to gauge whether or not there's a lot of uncertainty today, for instance? Yeah, again, through the chair, just we would see how the meeting goes um, and and how the how the feedback and the comments are. Um, if uh, the feed like we've already received the feedback from you that you didn't have adequate time to prepare to prepare, so. Um, we'll take that into consideration when we um, decide where to go next. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm good, Mr. Chair. Call the question. Okay. I, as this is a committee of the whole meeting, I do not have a script for uh, <laughs> motion up front of me, so I, I apologize if the wording isn't exactly correct, but I believe that uh, it looks like Mr. Kaiser has something to say. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to clarify the intent was to remove the specific date reference and just say a council meeting or committee of the whole meeting in March. Is that correct? Okay, if, if that's adequate to the mover, then then that, that can be done. I'll consider that an editorial change, and yes, it's adequate. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. So we'll just wait for the motion again as, as amended to display on our screens. And then what? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> All right, so I'll just I'll just reread it uh, for for council, uh, it, the, the motion is that council postpone agenda item five financial reserves policy update until an upcoming council meeting in March 2023. I can call that to question. All right, that motion is defeated four to three. So now we will move on to uh, section five, financial reserves policy update and invite Jeremy Eamon uh, to begin his presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Jeremy Eamon, the city's chief financial officer, and I'm here to present administration's report on the proposed revisions to the Financial Reserves Policy, FIN 21-C. And joining me today in the gallery to help answer questions are Shannon Andruco, Manager, Budget and Financial Planning, and Mr. Clayton Northey, Manager, Accounting and Reporting. The purpose of today's presentation is to provide committee members with information on the proposed policy revisions and to request your feedback for any additional revisions to the draft policy prior to it coming back to Council for adoption. Council first adopted the financial reserves policy back in July 2017, and in June 2019, Council adopted the second iteration of the policy with revisions. 
Recently, administration completed its scheduled review of the policy and is proposing that further revisions be made. The policy states that the city shall establish financial reserves and commit funds on an ongoing basis for four specific purposes, which are to meet future funding requirements, stabilize fluctuations in operating and capital activities, provide contingency funding, and reduce the need for debt financing. The policy also states that the city shall manage financial reserves in a responsible manner and use reserve funds solely for purposes specified and approved by council. Establishing and maintaining adequate financial reserves is essential for mitigating current and future risks and is considered a municipal best practice. The proposed policy revisions include a number of administrative changes to help clarify language and to align the policy with the city's current budgeting and financial reporting processes. Significant proposed changes include two new financial reserves, one cancelled reserve and other changes which I'll go into a bit more detail shortly. And just a reminder for ease of reference, the attract changes version of the draft policy is included as an appendix to the report. Administration is proposing that two new financial reserves be established. The first one is the Municipal Operating Projects Reserve. Its purpose is to fund one-time operating projects which are included in the Municipal Operating Budget and are not specifically funded from other financial reserves or eligible for grant funding. The Municipal Operating Budget is defined as the City's approved operating budget, not including utilities operations. Examples of qualifying projects include plans, studies, surveys, public engagements, short-term employment or labour contracts, etc. The funding for this reserve could come from annual contributions from the Municipal Operating Budget, allocations from the Municipal Operating Budget surplus, and or other sources approved by Council. The reserve's optimal balance will be established using a five-year historical average of annual one-time operating projects included in the municipal operating budgets approved by Council. In the past, the City's practice has been to fund these types of projects from the Financial Stabilization and Contingency Reserve, which does not align with its stated purpose within the policy. The second new reserve is the Utilities Operating Projects Reserve which will function similar to the Municipal Operating Projects Reserve, except that it will fund one-time utilities operating projects from the Utilities Operating Budget. Historically, these types of projects have been funded from the Utilities Infrastructure and Equipment Reserve, which again does not align with its stated purpose within the policy. The establishment and use of these two new financial reserves should lead to greater accountability and transparency over the funding, tracking, and reporting of one-time operating projects. Administration is also recommending that one financial reserve be cancelled. The Transportation Assistance Reserve is a restricted reserve that holds funds on behalf of the Fort Lyons Transportation Society. There has been no activity in the reserve since 2013. As part of the review, administration contacted the Society's board and they will be requesting the return of these funds and once payment has been made, the reserve will be closed. Details of other proposed changes to the financial reserves are in the report, so I'll just quickly highlight them here. The future facility operating reserve has been recategorized from stabilization and contingency reserves to projects reserves. The optimal balance calculation for the capital projects reserve will change to a five-year historical percentage applied to the first five years of the 10-year capital plan. The percentage is the share of total capital expenditures within the 10-year capital plan excluding levy-funded projects that have been funded from the Capital Projects Reserve. The Land Purchases Reserve has been recategorized from specific purpose reserves to projects reserves. The RCMP Equipment Reserve is an additional municipal infrastructure and equipment reserve used to fund the life cycle maintenance and replacement of equipment for specific use by RCMP members. The Facility Life Cycle and Maintenance Reserve is now recognized as its own reserve under the Infrastructure Life Cycle Reserves category. Previously, it was included within the Municipal Infrastructure and Equipment Reserve. This change was made to recognize that the reserve operates and is funded differently from the other Municipal Infrastructure and Equipment Reserves. The Youth Drug and Safety Education Reserve has been renamed from the Drug Abuse Resistance Education or DARE Reserve and this is due to the DARE program no longer operating in schools. 
And lastly, an optimal balance has been established for the perpetual care reserve. Use of a perpetuity formula will establish a target balance in the reserve needed to fund the annual cemetery maintenance costs on a perpetual basis. As for next steps, the feedback received today will be used to make additional revisions to the draft policy. The amended draft policy will be presented at a future regular council meeting for consideration and adoption by council. And administration will be bringing back recommendations to council for funding options to establish the proposed new municipal and, op and utilities operating projects reserves. And that concludes my presentation. I welcome your comments and feedback and my staff and I are happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Eamon. Um, I don't see anybody uh, ringing in for questions yet, so I'm just going to ask a quick one. Uh, the Youth Drug and Safety Education Reserve, um, it or it, 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 it's, it's getting renamed from the DARE Reserve because that program no longer exists. Uh, so how is this going to be used if it used to be used for a non-supported program and we don't have any type of need for that program any longer, I guess? Oh, I think you need to tap the mic in it again. Yeah, there you Sorry go. about that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to answer your question, um, so yes, the DARE program is no longer operating in schools, but in my discussions with uh, Ms. Rayner of Protective Services, I understand that uh, through the, uh, there's a continuing program, an education program for drug awareness in schools that is ongoing. So there is still a plan for use of those funds. And that would be in Just, collaboration with our Protective Services, is that that's, right? That's okay. correct, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Mayor Katcher. Okay, thank you. Um, so you no longer have the financial sustainability reserve? Uh, through Mr. Chair to your worship, uh, no, that will continue. There, there's the only change to the financial stabilization and contingency reserve itself will be the fact that one-time operating projects will no longer be funded through it. That would be the purpose of the new operating projects reserve. Okay, I missed that in there. So the and so the municipal operating projects reserve. So when you talk about that, um, as far as you're going to come back with the funding sources of how much funding, so that isn't written into this at this point in time. That is correct. Yes, it's not written into this. At okay, time. so that's something then we'll have to uh, decide on as a council. That's correct. Okay, and that's the same for the operating one. For the utilities, or utilities. operating, yes, yeah. that's right. And last question that I have, um, the uh, transportation reserve, the one for the Lions Club, how many dollars are in there? And um, so what was the purpose of that one? If you can just, because yeah. uh, I'm just curious how many dollars we would be turning over to them and if there's any um, requirement for them to use it for something s specific. Uh, through Mr. Chair to your worship, um, the um, balance as of the end of December 31, 2022 was about 63000 And again, I mentioned in my um, dialogue and in the, in the report as well, there's been no activity in that reserve since 2013. Um, it was set up initially, um, I honestly don't know when it started, it's been many, many years, but the city was doing the bookkeeping, the accounting essentially for the Transportation Society. Um, there were some grants going through it and whatnot. Um, they were held in on you know restricted reserve for that purpose. Um, there has, in my understanding and talking with the FCSS director that the board has asked uh, on occasion, like what's the, why are the funds not being returned? It was just, I just don't think it was ever dealt with properly. And so based on their discussions is that they, they're in the process of requesting for that return of those funds. It, I guess, but that goes to my question again. I assume the reserve was set up for a future purchase of, uh, of vehicles or something. So yes. would that be uh, contingent? you know, uh, giving it to them, but only being able to be spent on something like that, not on salaries or? To your worship, um, it, it's very difficult to determine what makes up that 63,000. Um, it was a series of like operating surpluses while the Transportation Society was in operation. Those funds um, could, yes, be used for the purchase of, of transportation vans and whatnot at the time. Um, I think in terms of, the basic understanding is it's no, they're not the city funds 
Um, they're the Transportation Society funds. Um, so what they do with the, the money, if that's if that's the case, that's that's really up to up to them. Okay, and I'm uh, sorry to sorry to uh, dwell on this one. I know Councillor Macon sat on. I was on it from 2007 to 2010. Uh, Councillor Macon sat on it for a period of time, and I'm just pushing back to see. You know, like I think that money was raised for a specific person purpose. I don't think it was raised for or uh, just from surplus, because I think they're pretty much broke most of the time when it came to just paying for stuff. So I, I guess I'm just asking we release that because I know they bought two vans and, and I would be fine with that money if it w went towards a van. But Yeah, so. and, 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 and to your point too as well, the the operation of that society was, was switched over to the Fort Lyons Transportation Society so that uh, also... Um, muddies the water so to speak but uh, we can definitely look at it more um your comment then has taken that that those funds should be specifically used for a specific purpose then yeah i'm not opposed to um you know getting rid of the reserve fund but i guess if you're handing over sixty three thousand dollars to an organization right. you want to make sure that the people who raised it before they came into existence it's actually used for what it was raised for so Point taken. Um, Thank you. other than that um i don't see a lot i don't have a lot of objections i think the changes that are made are you know i'm comfortable with the changes that are being made and then you come back with the funding sources okay so i'm good thanks Okay, thank you. Councillor Macon? A uh, quick comment on the Transportation Society is that it was my belief that when it got transferred to Lions that that money was being transferred at that time. So I think it's, um, I think you're correct in saying it was just something that was missed. It was anticipated by that society that they were going to be getting the funds when that transfer was made. So um, it's more of an editorial question and I'm just not understanding what I'm looking at in the um, tracked changes, is that in a lot of these reserves, the um, names of individual reserves are crossed out only to be reinserted in right below them with the exact same wording. And is it because it's now a link rather than the word? I just don't understand why that is in a number of places. Uh, through Mr. Chair to Councillor Macon. Um, I, I apologize for the track changes. It is a, a comparative. Um, it takes the original document back in 2019 and compares it to the current clean document. Okay. And so, for lack of a better term, it kind of does its own thing. It does a comparison. And to be honest with you, in constructing the changes, there was reserves moved around. And given that all of the reserve descriptions were in the appendix, um, the document... Um, Again, it was, it, for lack of a better term, Technology. it was very wonky. Yeah, oh, okay. it was very hard to deal with, so I apologize for that. No, that's fine. And I noticed that some of the reserves were being moved to different sections, and that made sense. And then I was like, what is happening? So, but that makes sense. All right, uh, that's it for me, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Councillor Kelly. Thank you. Jeremy, would it be possible for administration to prepare for council a table summarizing I guess the reserves before the change, the proposed changes with additions or name changes, um, and in that table insert the optimal balances, the current balance, and a column il illustrating the anticipated annual funding requirement for each reserve, so that so that I can visualize what it is we're we're um, trying to do here. Uh through Mr. Chair to Councillor Kelly, um, absolutely, that is something that can be brought back um, either at the next scheduled council meeting for um, our committee, the whole meeting for council's review, or brought back at the time when when the final review and adoption is what whatever council would prefer. But yes, we can provide that information. Is that all you had, Councillor Kelly? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will wait to get that and take that along with the information given this morning and look at it at that time. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Move on to Councillor Abitoye. Thank you for your presentation, Jeremy. Um, 
is the intention for this change is it to move more of the reserves from unrestricted reserves to more restricted reserves? Is that the intention? Uh, through Mr. Chair to Councillor Abbott Toya, um, no, I, I, I don't think that is the intention. Um, the restricted reserves are reserve uh, funds that are brought into the city from a third party, essentially, and they provide the restriction. Um, the example is the transportation assistance reserve would be one example um, where the third party gives the city money to hold on their behalf and it can only be spent according to their terms. And internally restricted would be council's decision as to where that money is spent. Yeah, so my, my understanding of restricted reserves is that they were allocated for a specific purpose, right? On like maybe fund like the reserves, like the stabilization reserve where it can really be used for anything. So th through Mr. Chair, through Councillor Abitoria, I think what you're referring to is committed. Okay. So when you have a reserve uh, balance that's committed, that means that council has approved um, it as a funding source for various projects, whatever they may be. So those funds cannot be spent on any other purpose. So, so, so back to my question, is that the intention then to have more committed, more of the reserves committed to specific um, things rather than just having this reserve and and the reason I'm asking this question is because I see like a lot of the reserves are actually in non-interest bearing accounts and I'm thinking why are we not seizing the opportunity right to make some money out of these reserves so through Mr. Chair to Council Abitoria, to the first part of your question, um, if you're specifically referring, say, to the new, the two new financial reserves that are being set up, I think um, the main purpose or the, for doing that and uh, was to, to give more clarity to the financial stabilization and contingency reserve that that is a contingency reserve that's set aside for, um, you know, for lack of, for disasters, for losses of revenue, um, unanticipated expenses, not necessarily for one-time operating <coughs> projects like studies and plans. And in a review of a lot of the financial reserve policies in other municipalities, and you look at the city of Fort Saskatchewan, a person is left wondering, well, where does the city fund those one-time types of projects? Unless you look at the budget document and you see, okay, financial stabilization and contingency reserve, that's where the study is being funded. Um, we're one of few municipalities that were doing that, that they all have operating projects reserves set up for that purpose. Actually, I like it. I think it's an amazing idea what you're doing. But to my second question, mm -hmm. why aren't they, why, why don't we have more of these reserves and interest bearing accounts? Uh, th through the chair to Councillor Abitoya. So interest bearing accounts, um, it's not to say that um, the financial stabilization and contingency reserve couldn't be applied interest, but um, it is the understanding that it is funded through operations that are that's where interest goes essentially when it's not allocated anywhere. It's it's it goes to operations, so in a, in effect, it is it is interest bearing. It's just not taking the balance of that reserve and applying an interest factor. We do that for our equipment reserves to recognize the fact that they're funding future items over time, the eventual replacement of a, of a tangible capital asset. So if we don't apply an inflation directly to that reserve, then we could run ourselves short when those project or when those capital projects need uh, replacement. So in a roundabout way, we do apply interest to, to, the, to the operating reserves, and we, we do that by funding them through operations, which that's where interest, that's the majority of where investment interest is. So, um, I think you just confused me. I, 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 I think what I'm, what I'm saying <laughs> is that we, we, we would essentially be double counting it, is what I'm trying to say. If we, if we applied an, in, an interest or an investment component to the financial stabilization, we've already transferred operating funds in there, so we've already transferred a portion of, in, of investment income. We'd be essentially double counting if we took that balance and applied it again. That's... Okay, um, let, let me be more specific. So yep. the land purchase reserve, because I'm, I'm pretty sure we're not using that fund like every time. So when I look at that reserve, for example, I'm wondering why do we not have it in an interest bearing account? Because we have like the perpetuity, perpetual reserve, for example, in an interest bearing account. I don't know, I see, I see Clayson trying to stand up, so... I can, yeah, I can uh, defer that question to Mr. Northy for sure. Uh, 
through the chair to Councilor Abertoya. Um, the interest bearing portion is really intended to offset the effects of inflation on current tangible capital assets. Um, and it actually is by having those as interest bearing, what we're doing is we're taking that out of the current year operating surplus. Um, Whereas capital projects where there's unspecified, the capital project reserves, the land um, purchases reserve and other, the operating projects reserves um, do not have the same, they don't necessarily have a specific use. So we factor in inflation by, um, for those projects, for those reserves, by allocating out the annual operating surplus um, the way we do uh, in usually in April every year. Um, so to make sure that we're achieving the optimal balances, it, it's all tied into the way that the optimal balance is calculated for each of those specific types of reserves and the time frame in which we plan to use those funds. Okay, thank you. I, I promise to go and watch this again so I can understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> I, I just had a maybe a follow up question because I think this is a great discussion that, that we're having right now about balances of let, let's talk about the operating future operating so one one time operating expenses because this is where all studies are funded right so would it would it maybe be advisable to have say a, a yearly cap on studies of in in certain areas for for a council we could say this is this is already budgeted for i mean any type of feasibility studies from that reserve and because that is is that right now not sort of limitless in a way uh through uh, through the mr chair um basically the Right now, the Financial Stabilization and Contingency Reserve um, has a has a balance in it. Um, it's fairly substantial, so really, it's limited by council's approval. Um, There's no ceiling on it either. It's in effect, that's it's correct. Or yes, discretionary. Yes. Yeah. The in, what you're saying is the entire reserve could be used to fund that. It wouldn't be um, prudent, but yes, it could be. And that's why we want to establish this separate reserve that has its own optimal balance. Right. Yeah, okay. I, did, I do support the work that you're doing. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure there's going to be future discussion. We'll move on to uh, Mayor Catcher. So the question that I have, I was looking for it. Um, this one is just the policy. Um, typically, we have the policy, um, why we have the policy, the statement about the policy. Um, but typically, there's a procedures that goes behind it and this one looks like this is rolled into all into one so was that the intent or is there an opportunity to have the policy with the guiding statements what the reserve funds will look like um, that type of information then behind it where it talks about the procedures so that if a procedure does have to change, um, you may not necessarily have to change the policy. There just may be something as, as um, you know, how you're, how you're dealing with something. Uh, through the chair to your worship. Um, that's, that's a good point, a uh, really good point. Um, we didn't plan on having a separate set of procedures for this particular policy. Um, are you suggesting administrative procedures, like how to apply the policy? Well, um, that's, yeah. that's what, don't we normally do that? Uh, not every policy, council policy that we have has procedures attached to it. Um, my understanding is that the procedures would be very administrative in nature, as it, it would be what administration does to interpret the policy. Um, I, I, I hadn't thought that it would be necessary in the terms of this um, policy, but maybe it, it's worthy of consideration. Yeah, and I just, when I look at it, because I come down to the guiding principles on it, and the guiding principles almost bring you into what would be um, as part of the procedures that you would have to follow. So, you know, and that's why I was looking at that, and I was actually thinking that there would be a procedures one that uh, finance knows that, you know, all transactions have to be approved by council, um, you know, um, reserve names, because Typically, if it's just, you know, a minor change, that could be done just through the procedures or something. Uh, through uh, 
Mr. Chair, to your worship. Um, I think the intent of the policy, though, again, is that council establishes the reserves. It's not up to administration to create new reserves, that this requires council's approval, um, as well as the transactions going in and out of the reserves requires council's approval as well. Um, that's the way the, uh, the policy is written. Um, Okay, and I, yeah. I won't belabor it. It just when I started getting into all the guiding principles and everything, mm -hmm. that felt like more like it was procedural to me when it came to that. So I won't belabor it. Okay. If that's the comfort level and, and everybody's okay. good with that, I'm fine with that. So, okay, thank thanks. Okay, thank you, Councillor Kelly. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy, as part of this process, as administration, taken another look at and updated the optimal balances for each reserve? Uh, to the chair, or sorry, through Mr. Chair to Councillor Kelly. Yes, we have. We have um, reviewed all of the optimal balances that uh, currently existed. And as I mentioned, the perpetual care was uh, another um, optimal balance that we added. Um, and that was basically from discussions with departments, we reviewed them, and as well as looking at outside at other financial reserve policies and uh, research articles on the topic. Okay, thank you. The information was late arriving this morning. In the revised information, are the new optimal balances stated? Through the chair to Councillor Kelly, yes, they are. Okay, thank you. I'll watch for those. I still would appreciate the, the summary. If you could do one, please. Um, I think just to follow up on, on a comment or suggestion that perhaps the chair had, if I interpreted it correctly, it, 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 it echoed a concern that I've had through multiple budgets now in that it seems, and I could be dead wrong, but it seems that if the, if the project is funded out of reserves, That gives council, perhaps in my mind, um, for lack of a better word, too much comfort, as opposed to funding one-time expenses out of operations. I think if we did that, we might find that council focused more on the one-time expenditure and whether or not it was absolutely necessary because it would affect taxes at that time. Now, I know that we're trying to smooth out the tax impact, but that's also just part of smoothing out our operations. That's part of normal business practice, um, smoothing out your operations to your revenue stream. So I, I wonder if you could comment on, if you have any comments on the approach of council when we're spending from reserve rather than actually incorporating the expenditure into an operating budget. Through Mr. Chair to Councillor Kelly, um, that's that's not an easy question to answer. Um, I would say that um, funding it through a reserve um, is very much like uh, using dipping into your savings account, um, whereas operation would be your your checking account, for an example. Um, it would be difficult to adjust the operating budget for a particular department one year um, that they'd have say a study that would to be funded and then take it out of that operating budget the next. Um, we do that anyway when we build the budget but with the reserves um, there's just I think a, a, a better way of tracking um, tracking those projects and being able to sum them if they're hidden they're almost like they'd be hidden within the operating budget if uh, we allocated them to departments um, when they're funded uh, through council approved uh, uh, approving the budget process through a reserve there's there's just better tracking in my opinion and, and I appreciate that I, I, I with respect I think I would I would differ with your opinion um, if it shows up as a line item on the departmental budget um, reserve, or pardon me, study for whatever, uh, it's it's easily tracked, and um, I just think that the, the the impact psychologically, if if the impact is on the current year tax re, tax um, notice to the residents, it gets a different a different look from from council. So I, I'm sharing an opinion. 
I'll think about it. We can talk about it when this comes back again. And I, I appreciate your comments. Um, I don't think, though, that the tracking part of it um, is necessarily logical. I'm sure you have the capability to track it either way. And I'm just looking at the psychological impact when we're actually dealing with budget and whether or not one versus the other approach would give a better result at the end of the day. And I don't have an answer. It's a yeah. philosophical question, but, but one that I think we need to talk about. Thank you. I was just going to add to that, um, just to clarify my comments, is that, um, in effect, it is it does flow through the the operating budget. Um, there is it does show up under contracted services if it's a third party study. Um, that's funded. It, it'll show two line items. It'll show the expense and it'll show funding from the reserve. Um, so what I meant by my comment about better tracking is that um, you can clearly see where that uh, is funded from. Uh, that is funded from the reserve in this case. Whereas if we didn't, it would just show up as an extra expense. Um, within the department operating budget. So just to clarify that. And thank you, Jeremy. And, and, and I agree with that comment. It um, just doesn't have a current year um, property tax impact. And I, and I wonder if that doesn't affect decisions once in a while. Correct. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Councillor Kelly. Just as a follow-up to that discussion, so what would need to be done for... Um, f future studies, and I, I'm not going to blanket say all studies, but maybe a majority of, of council initiated studies for them to be coming out of operating instead of reserves. What what changes would we have to make um, through finance? What is it a policy change? Is that is that something that would have to be a procedural change? I guess that's not quite a thing here. Uh, so through uh, to Mr. Chair, um, so the, the difficulty I guess with, with that again goes back to my previous comment is that the operations of a particular department um, is, a, is a flow through. It's, a, um, it's an annual continuation until budget changes up, reduce or increase a particular amount within that budget. So one times would be, would cause this blip right. um, in, in expense. And so, so what I, you're saying is that it wouldn't be reflective of that year's operating cost for that department based on how they budgeted it. And then if if council brought something forward that wasn't within their budget, then it's then it really skews the, the data from that budget for the year. It, it would be something that would be budgeted for. But again, if you're comparing it from one year, from like the current year that it's been approved to a previous year, it would show a, an increase in expense um, and there would have to be an offset, like say for tax funded, right? It would, it would flow through as tax funded. So it, it'd just okay. be a different way to, to show it. Do you have a comment? Oh, sorry, um, oh, your chair. chair. Um, I just wanted to add that currently, one other change that would happen with our operations is we currently, we don't generally um, authorize carry forwards of current year operating dollars. Um, because of the nature of studies and other similar one-time projects, quite often they don't necessarily follow our annual operating cycle. So sometimes you, they may need, they may require carryover into a future year. Um, by funding through a reserve, funding through a, an operating reserve, um, we care that allows us to carry forward those funds into the future year so that we can complete the work. Whereas they would essentially, if, if for instance, uh, uh, one of the studies that are currently ongoing, I believe the, uh, the RC Strategies uh, REC study, for instance, was carried, um, because it's now carried over into 2023, essentially if it were operating funded, it would become unfunded unless there was additional money put into the 2023 budget. Does that make sense? I, I see, yeah. So it, it does arrive, in, invite some complexities, and especially if there was a transition. Okay, but thank you very much. I don't see any other, other questions uh, from Council, so uh, I will move into... Thank you for your presentation, for your time you. this afternoon, Mr. Eman, and we'll see you again soon on this subject. So I'll in now invite uh, Mr. John Dance and Mr. Clayton Northy forward to uh, present fees and charges policy review. Point of order, Mr. Chair, would it be oh. possible to get five minutes before we start? Is that yes? Absolutely. Okay, uh, Council will <laughs> will then recess for five minutes and we'll reconvene. The clock is different here. We'll reconvene at four twenty-five. Council is now in recess.
All right, Councillor Kelly, are you there? Okay, great. So we will um, reconvene the meeting uh, with uh, item number six, fees and charges policy review uh, with John Dance and Clayton Northey. So go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, as indicated, my name is John Dance. I'm General Manager of Corporate Services. With me is Clayton Northey, Manager of Financial Reporting and Accounting. Um, we are here for a, a couple items, a scheduled policy review of fees and charges. There was also a motion that Council had made in September to, uh, to bring this item back, both as part of the scheduled review as well as looking at um, some additional economic principles associated with fees and charges. So the outcome of today, what we hope to achieve, is that Committee of the Whole has provided feedback on the policy and administrative recommendations that are contained within the attachment to the report prior to this policy coming back to Council in April, ideally. We took a slightly different approach to the work in terms of the amount of content that was provided. So rather than a conventional report, we tried to break it up into manageable pieces for a little bit easier reading. There's a lot of material within here. So within your package appendix A, our intent isn't to go through that package in detail, but just to, to walk through it quickly and highlight some key items uh, prior to Council initiating some discussion and some questions. From a, back, back, from a background perspective, um, it's interesting note that um, two policies that were here today were part of a whole uh, series of policies that were established in 2017. So just to acknowledge some of the work that came out of the financial system strategies, the fundamental policies that were part of that were user fees, assessment composition and tax rates, reserve, debt, surplus, financial reporting, procurement, um, asset management, and operating and capital budgets policies. So there was a large series of policies that came out of the uh, the 2017 work and we're time flies and we're in a review process to to update and continually improve those so the actual fees and charges policy was approved by council in september of 2019 and the administrative procedures attached to those for the departments were also done at that time within the package we've also provided some information on the access for everyone program both in terms of recreation as well as the the transit program so the current fees and charges policy has guiding principles, funding categories, and key factors, which we will go into in a bit more detail as we go through the presentation, but they are fundamentals in the policy that um, provide guidance for the current fees and charges. From the 2023 budget fees and charges, there's also a page that just gives you some background on the numbers um, in terms of the revenue for fees and charges. This year, we've provided a fair bit more detail in the budget document about where we were and where we came with fees and charges in terms of, of the source. So as you look at the user fee revenue, the fines and penalties, as well as the user, uh, user rates and charges attached to utilities, it... Uh, totals approximately $31.2 million or 35.3% of the city's total, all, total overall operating revenue. So a significant amount of revenue when you add up the user fees, the utility charges, and the fines and penalties. Wide ranging fees that take us anywhere from items under a dollar to I believe our highest fee is $46,000, just slightly over $46,000. We have approximately 1,054 fees that Council looks at. One of our recommendations is to try to streamline that number and get that down to a more manageable number in terms of the document that Council has to look at and the size of font that's attached to those. From a research perspective and looking at municipal practices, there's a number of documents that we've linked in the attachment. I would highlight work that was done by RC Strategies in Abbotsford as some strong work that came out in terms of looking at a way to quantify benefit and community benefit. It wasn't something that we seeked out. It was something that we arrived upon just through searches, but it's, it's very strong work that's come out of, uh, of the city of Abbotsford, and they're in the midst of 
of implementing some of that work. There's also a number of different financial um, economic principles articles that we, we've had attached as well, and then some municipal things from the City of Edmonton predominantly. There is work going on in the region. A lot of the work is ongoing, so we don't see a lot of the documents. Just talking to Mike Roma earlier, uh, prior to the meeting starting, he indicated that there's a number of people in the region who are having these conversations. We're just not seeing the outcomes publicly yet of that work. I will take a bit of a break and just allow Clayton to introduce some of the economic concepts. Um, the, um, we, we did take a look at a few of the uh, specific economic principles that may be applicable. There's a number of others that um, you could apply. Um, really, these largely are business case analysis type uh, tools, things that you can use. Um, they can be used on your ongoing uh, fee setting process, but are probably best uh, done as part of a consideration for a business plan for a particular program or um, a capital investment um, decision. Um, one of the topics that I covered, um, sensitivity analysis, this really just looks at um, the really the risk um, of um, changes to program costing, util um, user um, preferences, and user uh, utilization rates. Um, the essentially, as part of your sensitivity analysis, quite often what you can do is uh, really looking at the cost side. Um, is in budgeting, you're going to set a rate that um, a, a utilization rate, for instance, that's less than 100 percent. If you're seeing trends that, if you see that you're highly sensitive to a significant change in, or even a significant volatility in uh, you in utilization, um, one of the challenges, and this is probably true for most of them, um, the challenges we face probably relate primarily to understanding our non-financial data, unit unit prices and costs, and cost drivers. Um, benefits in this really is about managing risk, um, calibrating assumptions um, to make sure that we minimize, especially unfavorable variances, but variances overall. Price elasticity of demand is um, a, a type of sensitivity analysis where it really focuses on um, how impactful um, changes in um, changes in price will affect the utilization rates. If you raise uh, you raise a particular user fee by a dollar, does it increase the, uh, does it decrease the um, utilization significantly? Does it change it significantly? If it, is it one dollar, is it five dollars, is it ten dollars? Um, how does that impact um, usage? Um, what that can be done can be used in a number of different areas. Um, for instance, it's a, a useful tool in determining um, or optimizing your revenue streams um, f in non-peak or targeted user groups um, to maximize revenue. Um, it can be used, for instance, in a situation like a membership fee for the for the DCC or for uh, rec membership fees, um, optimizing that rate so you maximize the number of people buying potentially without necessarily seeing um, u utilization actually happening because now you have people, you're spreading over the, um, the revenue stream um, more broadly. Um, again, challenges uh, really needs to be considered in conjunction with your other sensitivity factors, your, your elasticity of supply, your marginal cost analysis. Um, there are risks with over, under, an over or underestimating demand um, and again, uh, probably um, business unit support and entrenched practices may also um, uh, challenge this process as well as public consultation, uh, the need for additional public consultation. It may result in better facility utilization. It could generate more revenue or both. Um, marginal cost would be the third piece that um, I really tackled in with uh, with economic development or economic principles, um, this really looks at um, what is the cost to um, to add, say, add an hour of swim time to a harbor pool, um, or to add um, increased capacity, add an additional lesson if that's possible into a facility um, to run concurrently. Those the um, 
really where it relates to is having a what's needed in order to do this sort of analysis is to um, have a really deep understanding of both your fixed and variable costs uh, for providing those services before you apply any sort of subsidization rates or um, cost recovery factors. Um, the, because you really need to know, um, and it ties back into the RC strategies approach to, which uh, again is linked um, to determining what is your cost, uh, what are your fixed costs to operate the facility, what is your, or your capital cost for replacement of the facility as well as your um, users. Um, it, this is a really effective tool for making capital investment decisions or making um, changes to your utilization uh, to, to your capacity, in, either through adding hours again or increasing the size of your investment. It can also be really um, useful in optimizing, this will tie back to RC, strategy, or RC, RC strategies earlier tonight, optimizing the size and shape of your pool um, or what, uh, or other facility um, to maximize the, to minimize the unit cost um, to residents, minimize and, or optimize those costs so that we get maximum value out of the facility that we produce. Um, some of the challenges, again, very similar to the other ones, having a really deep understanding of those uh, fixed cost, uh, variable cost, cost drivers, um, unit uh, level, uh, non-financial data that drives the costs, and again, entrenched practices uh, and support, business unit support. I'll pass that back to John. Thanks, Clayton. Um, as I stated earlier, I think our policy in itself has some solid foundational <coughs> elements to it. And I think the importance of providing with, with departments uh, additional tools and additional certainty in terms of some of the elements are, are really what's most critical. And, um, there's a number of recommended changes that we've put within the background package and initial one being costing data. I think as we look at the different ways to look at um, subsidy levels or, or cost recovery, it was ju it's just simply making certain that everybody is on the same page. So as you look at the data that we have for program-based costing and priority-based budgeting, it tends to be at that departmental level. So it will in include some costs um, outside the, as an example, outside the, uh, since we're on the swimming pool theme, outside the swimming pool, it would allocate costs across the recreation department as well. So it would pick up additional costs outside just solely harbor pool. So at a direct cost, um, level, it's done at a departmental level, but there's no certainty that, that that's done in different, uh, in different elements. So standardizing the costing data um, is important. Uh, the tools that we have as well to be able to locate um, those costing and track that costing as part of the software that we have with priority-based budgeting, so it makes sense that, that, that we continue to do that. There's, there's the ability to go further, as Clayton had talked about, for inclusion when relevant of indirect costs and fixed and variable cost breakout and capital costs, but that foundational piece of, of formalizing the program costing as the base level data source is important. Um, I mentioned uh, Abbotsford and their ability to work on a model to quantify benefits received. So a lot of what we talk about when we talk about fees, specifically in recreation, is that there's a community benefit. Um, but Abbotsford has worked on a model that actually quantifies that to be able to say, based on the number of different factors, here's what we believe that percentage should be. Then that's, a, that's been worked with council on that, and then the community is aware that for certain programs, it, it may be that it's deemed that there's a community benefit of 50% or 75%. But again, our policy talks about the benefits received process, it's ingrained in our policy, but we don't give the tools and the guidance to departments and, and for the public and for council to be able to see that as well. So I think that's an important step as well, that we actually are able to, to work on a model. Um, there's a degree of complexity to it, but there's also a degree of, of simplicity as, as well. Um, so that's the second area about benefits received. That was part of the council motion as well, was, was for us to go away and look at that. Refining further the, the public engagement components so that we're working closely with, with community groups and, and the community itself in terms of timing for any changes. These are long-term processes that, that are put into place so that we are 
you know, people are made aware of, of what we're trying to achieve. So there's a number of other smaller items attached to to that um, in terms of policy changes that are referenced in our in our background package and, and Clayton talked a bit about economic principles when they're applicable and understanding the those those when they might be used. Um, some some conclude some concluding thoughts prior to, to questions or to kind of our final page. Um, these are important conversations. Um, I think continuous improvement in all our and all our policies is important, whether it's reserves or whether it's fees and charges of, of looking at what we can do to improve it and to give additional tools to, to the organization and so that it's transparent and the community can see as well. So there's not a lot of conversations taking place currently that people have finished this work. So, you know, we've provided excerpts to Edmonton's white paper and, um, you know, there's a lot of work they're still doing as well. I've said it a couple times, I'll say it one more time, we have a solid policy framework in place and more practical guidance is really, really what's needed for departments. The program data that we have is valuable for understanding the costs of service and cost recoveries and subsidies. The data is updated annually and trackable year over year. Ironically, what we do is the scoring method, and I've said this a few different times um, with programs or capital, as we score our programs, the final score or the quartile isn't nearly as important as what the individual scores are across results and across the attributes in, in the costing. We are actually looking at, you know, one of the attributes we score is cost recovery. It's increments of 25%. So we've already got the start, the start of it in place. It's just formalizing it and putting targets within there. I think the other concluding, one of the other final concluding pieces is just the degree of change and timelines to implement. It's not something that happens quickly. Abbotsford in their report set a three-year implementation time frame to do their work. So it's not something that happens overnight. Um, the financial, the bird article, call it the bird article, it was the economic principles article, but it refers to the stickiness of fees. And once you establish fees, it can be difficult to change them. There's a degree of objectivity. There's a degree of subjectivity. I want. I think we want to introduce more objectivity, but there's there's always the level of of, uh, of subjectivity in there. The Abbotsford model. There's. I think it's about a seven step process, but one of the steps is adjusting for practicality and timelines. So not thinking that you can just set this based on this. Uh, this totally objective process, you have to factor in what's, what's in the community and what's in the organization and, and, and finding the time to be able to do it. So, and then just finally finding the balance for realistic and practical processes that add value. Um, we don't want to paralyze ourselves with complex processes that are just unattainable to be able to achieve, but we also want to be able to have good information and good guidance for the departments to be able to do their work. So it's a journey of continuous improvement in all of these policies. I'm very proud of the work that was done in 217 and 218, and this is just the continuation, you know, four and five years later to continue to mature our work. So brings to conclusion, and we're here for any questions or, or feedback. Excellent. Thank you for your presentation. I'll open the floor to questions, clarifying questions. Uh, Councillor Harris. Uh, John, um, I really like the direction that you're heading. If we can come up with an ob objective decision-making model <clears throat> uh, when somebody complains about their taxes or complains about a fee, we've got something that we can use by, by way of some level of justification. We're trying to do it in, in an objective <laughs> context. Uh, my my only concern with too much objectivity is you've got way you've got a lot of different variables to assess to to ask the question as to what a fee should be, and so the stickiness of, of fees that you referenced and and I read that in there and I I did have a chance to go back and look at the uh, the stuff from Abbotsford and I thought that was interesting, um, but sometimes you can be over objective. And so we're always going to have a, have a situation where we have to consider some subjectivity and we're going to have this fee at this level subsidized or otherwise for a lot of different reasons but that maybe some people would say, well, I disagree with that. But at least if we have some background and some justification for these, 
then I think it's a little bit, or it is a large step in the right direction. So I support those ob objective tools uh, that you're, you're working to create. And over the time that I've been in government, this is obviously starting to center on, on better decision making, I believe, in the long run. But I don't see this as a short-term fix. And as you say, this will take quite a while, and it'll be an iterative process at best, I suspect. Correct me if I'm wrong. So those are just observations about this uh, and uh, an appropriate way that when you bring <clears throat> uh, fees and charges to council during the budgetary process, uh, you've got something to hang your hat on and we've got something to challenge you on or not, as the case may be. So uh, I, like, I like the direction the work's going. No question in there? Well, it's an observation. I'm giving them some feedback. Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you. I'll give you a heads up. I might not have questions either and just a series of observations. Uh, both of you, thank you for your comments. And John, I agree with you. There's been significant process progress made during and since 2017, but that gets us to where we are today. So. I read every study except Abbotsford, I will admit it. I will now go back and read Abbotsford. I think I didn't read it simply because it was a BC community and I probably didn't think it was of any value, but I will read it now. Um, with that being said, Hempson specifically refers in page 87 to the importance of using full costing as your base um, I think when you don't use full costing, that there should be a rational, rational rationale given as to why not. Um, the, the, all of the papers, particularly the bird papers, and I shared one with council some time ago that was different than the one you circulated, John. Um, bird is referenced in Hemson. Bird is also referenced in the Monk report that was done for Ontario or Toronto area. Uh, he, he knows what he's talking about. He stresses the need for data. And the data is deeper than understanding our costs. In fact, the data really, in my mind, that's the easy part, understanding our costs. We need to understand our market. Who is it we're serving and why? And that's the data I believe we're missing in our community. Uh, and I think we need to do some work on that. They also stress the need to communicate with the community. So you come up with a policy that states that fees will be established differently for different programs, differently for different times of day, differently for different seasons. Absolutely. But the rationale and the reason for that and the costs associated with all need to be summarized and communicated on an ongoing basis to the community at large so that everybody understands. And I don't think we necessarily do a good job with that either. Um, I think it is important to recognize that council, and, and again, the economic papers mention this uh, in more than one occasion in the papers I read, that council is here to, to represent all residents, not just those with the loudest voice. And part of that communication process must be to disseminate data, gather data, disseminate data, and look for feedback. Is it iterative? Absolutely. No question. It's going to be an ongoing chore. The fact that it is important, I think, is evident from the fact that multiple communities across the country and in our province and with our neighbors are actively doing it right now. Uh, I think it would help if there was a change in emphasis. And this is referenced again in the economic reports. Uh, I think the overriding goal should be full cost recovery, in other words, you pay for the full benefit received. And if council or administration or both determines that that's not reasonable, then the rationale should be to why we're discounting from full cost rather than leaving it up to disgruntled members of 
the community or perhaps concerned counselors suggesting that the fees should increase. Leave it up to those that want change the focus so that those that want a discount need to explain why. I think that changes the focus and would make for a better long-term discussion. Uh, uh, give me a second, I'm not quite done here. The purpose of the fees too, I, I think it's in, incredibly important to understand what the economists are driving at. And it's not to maximize revenue. It's absolutely not to maximize revenue. What it is, is to, to, to establish a fee system that leads to an efficient allocation of our citizens' resources for the, for the benefit of the community as a whole. So if, and I'm just gonna give a hypothetical example. If with a new swimming pool, the true cost recovery per visitor should be $25, and the market, the market is telling us, the customer base is telling us that they're not prepared to pay more than 750. So I think that it, that would cause, should cause in this, in this hypothetical, hypothetical example, administration and council to step back and say, listen, if in fact the market is, is, is requesting this level of service, why are we trying to provide more? That's the efficiency that we would gain if we truly understood our marketplace. The elasticity comments that, that Clayton alluded to or briefly touched on flow from knowing your data once we understand our market. And if administration played with the fees and started changing fees and peak times, for instance, um, you would get a better understanding of what the true elasticity is. That would help understand where, in fact, our maximum fee should be, which would then in turn help us understand how much as a community we should spend to deliver that particular service. Uh, All right, Councillor Kelly, I do have some others that are want, want to ask questions yeah, and speak as well. It is, is now I a good time to... Oh. I'll sign on again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Mayor Katcher and then I have a couple questions here myself. Okay, thank you. So uh, mine's kind of a comment too. Um, I read the report and very pleased with the final uh, conclusions of it. As you indicated, it's uh, in the bullet points says we do have a solid policy framework for the fees and charges. And uh, I agree that we, our administration can always take a look at what's going on, you know, in the marketplace and what's going on in the region. But we always have to remember that, you know, we're a population of 30,000 and, you know, we're very fortunate to, you know, to be able to provide our citizens you know with with reasonable costs you know my only concern comes from if you raise the fees too high then the people who aren't getting the everyone can play uh, at no cost fee um, then all of a sudden you've got a whole bunch of people that uh, no longer have the ability to pay that extra and I think in the world that we're living in right now where groceries are going up, you know, uh, people are becoming more and more limited with the dollars that they have to spend. I think if we can keep children and youth and people in recreation, even if we have to subsidize it a bit with all of our tax dollars from businesses from industry you know from all of us and even those who don't use it i think we're doing a benefit to our community so i think you know for administration they just have to remember the benefits when when people are busy doing something and and it's affordable for them to do it that they're not going to go out and start um uh start causing trouble in the community and i think busy busy youth and busy people are make for happy communities so you know i just caution when we talk about cost recovery and full cost recovery because we're very fortunate in the industrial heartland to be able to have um, a tax base that helps subsidize some of these so i'm going to leave it with that but uh, uh, very pleased with the end result of the conclusions i think you're doing a great job i think it, council's doing a great job so thank you yeah, thank you. Um, so, so I had a, 
a couple questions for you, and there may be more philosophical questions regarding user fees and, and how we gauge our user fees against other, um, or how, how we, I guess, create and maintain our user fees uh, in comparison with other municipalities. And this is something that we have discussed in brief at before. And I'm wondering what, maybe in your own words, like the, the merits of, of continually gauge, gauging them against another municipality who, who doesn't offer the exact same service laterally in any department, I would argue, uh, as we do. Um, and also further to that, how, like how, how much are we using comparators, um, price structures to, to reflect our own? Because I, I know in every department, there's, there are four or five factors that affect how we develop our user fees. So can you, can you give maybe a, a brief understanding of that? Certainly. Um, I would say it's one factor. Um, I think what we're moving towards is making it still a factor, but looking at other things. Um, it depends on the on the fee, and I'll you know I'll give the example of probably ice or indoor fields is probably one of the best ones. Is that we do look at the region um, in terms of what other people are are charging, and then adjust our fees based on that, but not solely on that. Um, so inflation is another one. I'd argue over time in my time spent in recreation, um, probably it was those two factors, comparators and inflation were the most important things. And I think comparators probably took a higher weighting in some cases in, in another municipality in terms of how fees were set. So would you say, can I, can I just interrupt there? Uh, would you say that that would have to do with gaining market share for a municipality in, in essence? Like if, if so, if, if our user fees are too high and we're seeing nobody book our ice time, for example, and all of a sudden we have all this ice time, obviously there's a problem with our user fees, right? Is that, is that something that you've seen before that, that has impacted how they're set? Uh, certainly in certain instances in my time in the indoor soccer world, without question. Um, you know, the indoor soccer fields didn't necessarily want to have prices outside what was kind of that base fee because then, you know, people would be going around and shopping around and looking for an affordable rate and you were left with open space. So in some cases, that one in particular, it did happen. Right. Um, so it's a complicated one. And I guess that's, the whole essence of this is it's very complicated. It's not one factor, but the more tools that we can give, um, and comparators always has to be a factor, or, or generally is a factor in most cases, most fees, um, but not the sole factor. Yeah, I, I appreciate the, the answer, and I appreciate the complexity of, and you know what, a blanket statement, user fees, it's, it's really hard and we, to, to, to make a guideline for, for everything that's going to work or, or, or make a general rule about how we can how we can structure them. My, my other question had to do with objectivizing, I guess, or the, the sense of maybe community and quality life that, uh, that, that is created through, through a, a user fee. So if somebody wants to go, they absolutely love swimming. They want to go use their swimming pool, but, but that fee is $50. And then all, all of a sudden they cannot access that amenity because it's too high. But if it's low enough, then, then, and, and it could be within a, you know, five to 10, $15 range, something like that, then, then they're going to be extremely content and they're going to be satisfied using that facility. How, how, how do we, this, this is another philosophical question, I guess, and maybe, you can extrapolate your answer a little bit, but how, like, how do we gauge that sense of, of, of community and, and, and what it's, what it's creating for our citizens and then apply it? I think maybe I'll, I'll start and then maybe I'll turn it over to Clayton to talk about some of the economic principles about low fees versus, you know, in the building of, of different amenities. So um, I think one of the things in that Abbotsford was able to do was to actually say, here's what we believe is 21 benefits for, and this is, again, specific to recreation. Here's 21 benefits that we believe are associated with recreation. Um, there's nine community benefits, and there's 12 individual benefits. So by articulating those and putting that into policy, they're saying to, to the community, we believe certain programs have a community benefit. This is what that community benefit is. We believe also based on 
the type of activity that you're doing in recreation, whether it's a program, whether it's a rental, whether it's a, a spontaneous use based on the activity type. Is it a, is it a tournament? Is it a private event? Is it a public event? Um, and based on the type of participant age groups, you're able to then make this framework and model that says, we believe swimming lessons are, and I don't know what they actually arrived at, but we believe there's a 50% community benefit attached to swimming lessons. We believe that subsidy level should be 50% as a target. So it may take us a number of years to get to that target, but we believe that's what the target should be in the Abbotsford model. Right. Okay, thank you very much. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll move on to uh, Councillor Kelly again, second round. Oh, oh, sorry, actually, I'm going to go to, if, if it's okay, uh, Councillor Abitoye first. I didn't see you there. Councillor Kelly, if you can, if you can... Okay. Well, I'm good to go first if, if Councillor Harris is, because I don't think he has asked any questions yet. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, no, I think this is a um, very important um, discussion that we're having here, and I really enjoyed the um, presentation, so thank you for that. And just looking at just different things like the sensitivity analysis that Clayton had talked about and how that can, um, you know, easily influence, you know, utilization rates, assuming we change the prices and um, the market marginal cost analysis, um, um, you talked about the importance of really understanding the costs, both fixed and variable costs. So it seems like maybe we do not currently fully understand those costs and we may be looking at those costs in silos rather than the full um, cost. And I understand all the different aspects because really we should, we should be looking at all the various factors that influence this. Um, but the question I have is, it's, it's a very complex situation. I can't even imagine having to do all these steps, but what should we be expecting in April? Expecting in April with the, I think in April, the hope is that we get the fundamental policy principles in place, add the detail that we've recommended around them to get that. The results of that work might not be in effect for the upcoming 24 budget, but at least we get those things and start to work on it um, in terms of it. We have a number of other things in addition to just the general budget work that's going on this year. We have a number of other kind of deeper looks that we're, that we're undertaking for programs and program costing that's, that's consuming us as well in 2023. So it's getting it in the queue to say, okay, here's the things that we want to have it. Let's work, work towards that. Because I think it's valuable for, it's very valuable for council to be able to see some of these elements. It's valuable for the community and it's, it's equally valuable for administration to actually have something. So when we say, what's the benefit? Well, here's a framework. It's not going to be perfect. And it's not going to be necessarily everything, but it's something. It's yeah, an no, no, I, I agree with what you said, and I think it's really important for us to be able to quantify, fully quantify the benefits that's being received, right? But again, realizing that, uh, I like what you said about adjusting for practicality, you know. So it, it's nice to fully recover this cost, but we need to be practical, you know. Um, but that's what I had. Thank you. Well, thank you. So we'll go to second round of questions, and yeah, Councillor Harris. That's um, okay, it's pretty simple. Uh, so my question is, how do utility fees and charges uh, enter into this discussion relative to the use of utility rate models and how capital enter fee setting discussions? Because obviously we recover capital to establish appropriate fees for utilities. Should these two things not be in the same overall discussion? Or have we, correct, correct me if I'm wrong or point me in the right direction, do we have it quantified in terms of utility rate modeling as a fee setting tool? Uh, uh, through the chair to Councillor Harris, um, the utility rate model is by and large where we want to be in terms of finding a, a determining full cost, uh, make sure that we have the appropriate variable rates um, and fixed rates um, in, t um, in there. Um, so really, it's already there. With respect to community benefit, um, we take a different approach. That we are saying that it's fully it's um, fully funded through the rate model, um, through the rates rather than uh, tax subsidies. 
Um, but otherwise, that's the level of the utility rate model that we use is the level of detail we probably need in most of our other fee setting programs. Yeah. So you're saying that that is separate and distinct and should stay in its own realm and bailiwick as opposed to being in the broader discussion about fee and charges establishment? Because it almost seems to be a subset of the whole overall discussion. Through, through the chair to Councillor Harris, um, no, I'm actually not saying I'm saying that it's an example of where we have been really, really successful in implementing the user fees and charges policy. Hmm. Okay, but it's not discussed in this document as something that we use as a tool because you're creating more objective uh, decision-making framework. You're bringing less ob uh, subjectivity into it. And obviously, a utility rate model is totally objective because you've got hard data to work with and you ultimately charge those who ultimately use the service. Through your worship to Councillor Harris, that's correct. Okay, so you see them, they don't have to intersect in relation to this discussion. Okay. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you. Councillor Kelly. Thank you. Um, Councillor Harris, interesting concept, a different slant on, on the same thing that our subject that I wanted to bring up. And I think Clayton's answer was perhaps misinterpreted. So I'd like to just take a moment to clarify, make sure I understand. Um, the utility rate model is a model that, that mandates full cost recovery. And I think I heard Clayton say that ultimately, or ideally, that's where we would like to be for all user fees. So I do think that the model has merit. It's just that we're not there yet. Clayton, am I correct in what I just said? Um, through, uh, through the chair to Councillor Kelly, I'll, I'll maybe qualify that a little bit. Um, we need the level of understanding um, to, in order to enact um, the fully enact the, the policy as it is now, and as we're, we're proposing making changes to it, um, we need the level of data and the level of understanding that we have in the utility rate model um, that we can make meaningful estimates in terms of uh, demand with with the utility rate model. We have a, a model that shows how much water people typically use over a period of time. We know the variability in that. We can set our rates based on the variable rates based on that. Uh, we need that level of data in, say, rec fees um, or in uh, transit um, in order to meaningfully understand what the full cost is, whether or not council decides to subsidize or continue to subsidize those at a, at a subsidized rate, that's, a, that's another matter. But we need that level of understanding in order to have a, have a basis for having that discussion. But I still heard you say that that particular model works. It's just that we're not able to use it now. Maybe paraphrase that. Is that a correct paraphrase? Um, through the chair, that's correct. Perfect, thank you. Um, question for John. You mentioned the importance of comparators, I think in response to another question. John, in, in, I've read several authoritative papers on the subject of user fees. Um, I haven't seen, but maybe I've missed. In what papers and in what context do they, do these, people, these authors, suggest that comparators for the setting of a fee is, is important. Um, specifically, Councillor Kelly, I, I can't cite the, the, the articles. I probably am going, well, I am going more by just simply practice, municipal practice hey, in terms of what's in place across arguably most municipalities that I've looked at show who actually have articulated and written something down that, that comparators are a factor. I get it because it's easy. Um, and this is difficult. I would suggest to you humbly that the only comparator that we should as a municipality be concerned with is the cost of providing the service level and comparing those costs to our peers in the community. Um, 
it might be that in fact we're charging the exact correct fee but that our costs are out of line and we don't know that so i would be interested in those comparators for sure uh i have another question for you john and and i, I, I hesitate to put you on the spot but but i think we need to open up the discussion a little bit yeah. when we subsidize fees in our community and 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 and, and we're forced to talk about culture and rec because the bulk of the fees, and, and those are user fees for the utilities department, but we cover our costs there. So we're just looking at the fees where we don't cover our costs. So when we don't cover our costs, they're by definition subsidized. So John, is there data in your possession? Do we have data of any kind that would tell us as a council that when we subsidize fees, that the recipients of those subsidies are the lower income families that actually need it, need the subsidy? I, Councillor Kelly, I wouldn't be aware of any data like that that exists. As I, as I mentioned earlier, there is the one program that we have, the, the fee assistance program for both recreation and transit. Um, after that, um, I don't believe there is any data that is associated with a subsidization subsidy level to when any of our existing programs thank you i didn't think there was you referenced the uh and mr chair stop me when you think i've talked long enough uh john you referenced the the anyone can play or the other programs to help um certain individuals within the community and i support that by the way but that's separate and distinct from the user fee discussion not to be confused in my mind. Um, that's a separate policy that, that, that helps people that need help. User fees are distinct from that. Uh, go, go with it, absolutely, but completely distinct. We're talking user fees at this particular juncture. Uh, uh, Councillor Kelly, I, I do have one, one other uh, speaker on the list here. So if, if, if we could go there and then if you had any other other thoughts, then feel free. Not, not a problem. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Blizzard. Hi. Good presentation. Uh, uh, good information on this. Um, I just want to see one councillor is very concerned on full cost recovery. Um, I do think we would have an issue with cost recovery if we were to jump fees. It's been picking on the pool because that's what we've been doing tonight. If that was to go to $25 an hour, I think we would end up having zero cost recovery because you wouldn't have any attendees. So I think the cost comparators do need to be taken into account so that people don't go in elsewhere. We have facilities, we want them used, and that's going to be an important factor. I know myself, if if they were very high, I would be looking out of town. I wouldn't be coming here if they were way out of line with other facilities. So I think that's a reasonable thing that we need to do. Um, anyway, my thoughts. And just, I can just build on a little bit of what Clayton had indicated. I think understanding full cost is important. Not necessarily as Clayton had indicated, not always achieving that, but understanding what that is. For sure. I think we need to do it. There's nothing wrong with knowing what the full cost is of how much does it cost to run the pool. Um, but to assume that, OK, if we have X number of people, our assumptions could be high on those people. Our cost, assumptions could be incorrect and then we still don't have full cost recovery. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Kelly, you're last on the list here and then we'll make a motion to go in camera. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Councillor Blizzard. You gave me the perfect segue to what I wanted to say at the end. Um, I assume you are referencing me in your comments. I am not, and I stress this, not concerned with full cost recovery, and I do not anticipate or imagine for a second that we're going to jump the pool fees to 25 bucks. That's not at all what I'm saying. Not at all. What I'm looking for here is a rational approach with proper communication to our citizens that allows everybody to understand what it is we're attempting to do and why it is that we're doing this. That allows the citizens as a whole to participate in the conversation. The ultimate goal should be, yes, 
That might take 50 years to get there. I don't know. I know it's not happening in my term on council, and I wouldn't expect it to. So, so what we're talking about here are goals and policy. And please do not anticipate or assume that I'm promoting $25, because I used that in my example, $25 swimming fees. And we're not picking on the pool at this particular juncture, but the pool, as we just heard, is going to be a very, very expensive undertaking for the community as a whole. The community as a whole needs to and deserves to understand how the users are going to pay their fair share, whatever that is. And that's where I'm coming from. It's a policy, period. Nothing more, nothing less. Thank you, John and Clayton. All right, thank you for the presentation today and, and all your work on this. It certainly is very insightful to, to listen to what goes into creating this policy and it gives a new appreciation for the work that you do. So thank you. Um, I'll move on to item number seven now. Are there any councillor inquiries? We have one that I can see, Mayor Catcher. Yeah, and, and I know this meeting's been going long, so I hate uh, bringing up an inquiry, but I did have one member of the public contact me and uh, ask how some of the uh, new speed signs were put up because there doesn't seem to be some consistency. Um, so they gave an example um, as you're going out on Highway 15 towards Dow, when you hit 119th Street, uh, you get 80, but when you're coming back, the 80 reduces to 70 at almost at the Dow, at the Dow um, gate as opposed to up by 119th Street. So, um, and also on 101st Street as you're coming into town, I th into the city, I think there's a 50 and then, and then all of a sudden um, the 50s and the 40s, like they don't align where they're supposed, you know, where they come across equally. And also when you come in from uh, over by Clover Park, there's a road over there. They're saying those don't align either. So um, is, is that correct or, you know, or is that something they have to look at again? Uh, through the chair, we can take a look at those locations. Okay, um, yeah, so if you have that, if you can email something out and let us know if they're right or not, I can contact the person back. Thank you. That's it. All right, thank you. There are no other councillor inquiries, so I will need a motion to enter closed session, Councillor Blizzard. I'll make the motion that we go in camera for the items on our list. All right. Do you want to look? Well, Mr. Chair, uh, my, ah. East Ride, my East Ride timed out. I'll vote it affirmative. Okay, thank you. And I'll call that to question. It should be up on your screen. And that's carried. Council will enter closed session now. Well done, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah.